Welcome to Look, Listen, Laugh. Now, as a comedian, you have to create your own opportunities, and my guest today exemplifies that. He's not only created, but starred in his own TV series, his own theater production shows. He's a great comedian, lovely guy. I really enjoy his company, and I think you will too. Sit back, relax, enjoy my conversation with Tahir Biljik. Ah, here. Look at us today. We're the Blues Brothers. Well, Joel, I did say if I'm going to come on your podcast, we need to be matching. Yes. I said that, didn't I? You did. So thank you. Did. you. That, was your, um, that was your only guideline for, for this, your only request. There, there, there was two. Uh, matching, and so this is a unique tracksuit, yeah. by the way. Like, you can't, this is a one-off. Um, you're not going to get this anywhere. Yeah. And also, I said, please, make sure we have some plants yes. that can be seen. Because I feel like when you see, like, a 60-minute interview, when there's one plant there... It gives it more credibility. Yeah, gravitas. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah like, you it's know, professional. They we're, have one. Like, we got like... Ten, well, so, look at us today. We're in, well a done. we're in a nursery. <laughs> well done. You've outdone yourself. So I'm now ready. I'm now ready. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, mate. And I, I always say this. Whenever I hang out with you or catch up with you, it's always just pure joy. We, we always have a great time. You, we've known each other for many years. You were MC at my wedding. You know, you, I was. During, during I was. the lockdown. I know. That was the best. Yeah. What great times they were. Yeah. That was. Do you remember all the uh, staff at that uh, the function? Like, yeah. Yeah. At, yeah, at the reception at the Italian yeah. restaurant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And all, all of the... Because uh, you, you were emceeing the whole... Um, everyone's speeches oh. that were getting up. But it was like a, a they comedy were, gala. They were freaking out. Yeah. They're going, oh, there's Arj. Yeah. There's Akmal, yeah. someone else doing a speech, there's Carl Barron. Yeah. <laughs> just, they're like, oh, all right, this yeah. is amazing. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was uh, and the great thing about that too was because it was during lockdown, none of us had been out. That was the first time most of us had been out and actually seen each other yeah. within that year of 2020. So yeah. it, was a, it was a special night just for everyone to catch up. I know, I know. Now, we were, we were just chatting before, and I said, look, we should save this for the podcast, because you're, you know, you're a well-regarded uh, professional comedian who's had his own TV shows, had his own yep. live theatre shows, you've, you've, you've toured, had a huge successful run uh, at, the, um, at the Enmore Theatre for, for months, doing, doing one of your major theatre shows. Yeah, well... And, but all of that aside, you've got this keen interest in magic. And you've just been very, uh, you know, experimental. Usually it's the other way around. Magicians yep. want to be comedians. But you're a comedian. Th that's right. I come from a different point of view. So um, you have professional magicians. So look, I've always loved magic. And I've loved comedy magic in particular. Mm. And we have a, a shared passion and, and love for Jonathan Thurston. The, the, um, uh, the amazing, Jonathan, jo amazing, jo the amazing, <laughs> amazing Jonathan. Jonathan Thurston, the rugby league player. <laughs> I just I just interviewed him. The other day. Oh, you <laughs> did? Why, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why he's in my head. Uh, but the amazing Jonathan. Yes. Um, and uh, beloved, I, like the, the greatest comic yeah. magician the world has ever seen, ever. probably will ever see. And you like, toured with him and everything, and that's that's look at another podca podcast for that because yeah. it's all there. But um, but I remember when I saw Imagine Jonathan, I thought that's that's I want to be a performer like that. Yeah. You know, like but my love of stand up. Was uh, it's still my number one passion? It's, it's sure, too sure. much, right? I love stand too much, but I've always loved comedy magic. I've always collected tricks. I've always bought tricks. Yeah, for some reason, just mucking around with them, and um, it eventually led to a show. Eventually led to uh, AGT, right? Australia's Got Talent, which they said, please do it. I said, uh, after convincing, I said, I'll do it for fun because I do everything for fun. Mm -hmm. I don't worry about it. People go, what about you? Don't you worry about your um, about your image? <laughs> What image? <laughs> Who cares? Like people, are, like they've got me obviously hugely mistaken if they want to get that. Like I do things that I want to do. I went on the Celebrity Jungle show. Yeah, it was one of the best experiences of my life. Right. Yeah. So I've gone on the show, and funny enough, I talked to someone at the show recently, and there's this rumor out there I'd retired. It's so funny. They go, oh, yeah, we saw your major team. We thought you might have retired. After doing AGT. <laughs> yeah. like you've hit the pinnacle. No, no, no. I've retired from comedy. Oh, right. I said, never. What are you talking yeah. about? Right. Who, who, who told you that? Yeah. So I said, no, stand-up comedy is going to be something I'll be... I'm, I'm loving stand-up comedy more and more as I get older. Mm -hmm. So I just see myself doing it for as long as I can do it. That's it. That's as uh, simple as that. There is no... There's no need to retire from stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. 
that's one job you can keep doing as long as you go. Sure, sure, go, you can do it into like George Burns. Into exactly, the 90s. exactly. There's one job. Like, what did you retire for? Like, but that's what I that's what I love about you. You have things that you're passionate for. You just jump in and go. Oh, I'm going to give that a crack. I'm oh, going to yeah. go for it. I'm going to do it. It's like you, you don't you don't go through the whole. Uh, like you said, uh, what will people think? Will the image? That, no, I enjoy this. I want to do it. I'm going to do it. And I, I, to be honest, I actually love the experience. Yeah. Of, at the age of two. everything, I've like. Um, so yeah, I did. I did. Ma like so, magic. When I when I performed, and I created this character, world's best worst magician, mm -hmm. and um, people, the kids liked it. Adults liked it. It seemed to be a show for all ages. Accidentally, mm -hmm. by everything I've done has been accident. Like, it's, oh, okay. Different ages seem to enjoy this, and people who can can't come to my adult shows because of our kids were coming to the magic shows, right? Wearing their fully stick T-shirts and all this sort of <laughs> stuff, right? Um, but I come from the point of view of a comedian, a professional comedian doing comedy magic mm. as opposed to a professional magician doing a comedy magic show. Right. So they're concentrating on, oh, what sort of lines am I going to use? Like, you know, what sort of funny, I'm going to make the audience laugh. Mm. And whereas I'm going, look, that's the easy part. I'm thinking, how, how's this trick work? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the, how can that, I palm this? Well, sometimes I don't even palm it, but, but they that, see it and I just go, oh, yeah, yeah. A thing that you have in common with Jonathan is that neither of you really rehearse. You just figure it out right. on stage, and that's because like, that's something Actually, amazing. True. Jonathan used to always do. You go, yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out on stage, and um, I remember he, he would rush to like a magic store before yeah, going yeah. on um, Good Morning Australia. Yeah. He's never done the trick before, <laughs> and he's trying it on there, and he's trying to do the floating glass, and it's all the wires getting caught. He's ah, screw it, <laughs> throw it to the side. And so, yeah, yeah. but but that's what I see with you when you get up there. You're coming from like Jonathan did yeah. from a comedy angle, and the magic is kind of secondary to to. To, to that. You know why, yeah. Joel? Because I think I'm doing a comedy magic show. What's the worst thing, the thing that can happen? Yeah. The trick doesn't work. Yeah. Or but if that happens I exposed to a, it. But if that happens to a magician, the trick doesn't work, that's, that's the worst that could ever happen. Oh, that won't sleep for days. Yeah, but, but <laughs> for me, though, that's the funniest thing to watch. Jonathan yeah. and I used to sit up the back at the magic castle and watch magicians, and when they screwed up, it was the funniest thing. It was hilarious. Thing. And right? the more serious, the better, like guy doing a card manip. And he does, like, he was like doing a Spanish dance with yeah, it, yeah. to this music, tango music. And he does a spin around, but he lost his footing and fell on the ground, and all the cards <laughs> up in the air. And John and I are dying up the back watching this. Aha, <laughs> we know where they hit it now. <laughs> They're all over you. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. Like, so look, I've collected a lot of tricks, and eventually I had to do a show, mm. and it went well. It's been going really well. Um, then it's made me also realise why I love stand-up comedy so much. Right. Where I just turn up. Microphone. I can talk to whatever I want because yeah. the preparation is insane. Uh, yeah, I'm having a tour myself. with all that equipment, oh pre-setting everything. Oh, I was yeah. at the Adelaide Fringe. It was killing me. Like, you know, just <laughs> set, I, like I'm setting up for like two hours before the show. I've got to get there. Mm. I've got to set up. And then I'm waiting for the show. And I see all the kids and parents come in. I've got to do the show, then I've got to pack up. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is just not right. Yeah. It's fun when you do the show, right? Sure. And I've had all sorts of different um, children and kids and experiences and you get to learn. Uh, but it's pretty tricky because making a show for children, all different age groups laugh at different things. Yes. Like you could do a show just for four to seven year olds mm -hmm. and cause around that age group. And nine to 12 is different and the teenage is different. But um, I've somehow re accidentally again I stumbled on a show where, because I'm constantly on a comedy and, and I'm mucking around with the tricks, all ages enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the weird thing is, magicians come watch. <laughs> what are you watching <laughs> me for? What, what, what do they think? Well, oh, they're they're like, oh, we're going to watch these guys. So what is it? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an like, anomaly like, in the magic world. They go, oh, yeah, because you don't really fit a category. No, they go, that, look that. at this professional comedian. He's now in, into our world. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And no one, no one knows what to make of me or, or they're not sure what to do, but... But they turn up at festivals, mm. and they and they get in there and they well, I go. What are you here for? Mm. We, we want to see. We really enjoy the show. Like, yeah, great. And they go. Oh, what? And then they ask me about the tricks I'm doing. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're a magician. You should. You know. tell me. Yeah, yeah. Where'd yeah. you get that from? Yeah. Where have we all got it from? Yeah, Google. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like that's. I mean, and I get all the tricks proper, uh, proper, right? Yeah. So I, I do the right thing and, yep, and um, yep. buy the trick. I, I buy the buy, trick yep. and buy from the uh, original creator and yes. all that sort of stuff. And magicians, of course, they get. Really, really, uh, well, what can we say? Very defensive of oh, certain tricks. Right, right. Or it's like, and then, you're like, and then you're like, oh, did you invent that trick? Didn't that's you? what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, that's what I, uh, I've seen other magicians like, 
Oh, he's doing that's my signature. How can it be your signature trick? <laughs> you, you bought it from Tannen's Magic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from the same catalog that I, I have. I know, I know. Oh, that's, yeah. that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what you that's do. That's what a hundred other magicians do. Yeah, you But that's what a lot of people don't realize that these tricks are. Like, I have this kind of theory. A lot mm. of magicians are like tribute acts, right? Yeah, yeah. They're all that's... doing the same song, they're yep. all doing the same trick. Yep. But what do you bring to that trick? Exactly, right? exactly. And there are certain magicians, yes, that are anomalies, like, like a Kevin James, the magician who invents yep. his own stuff he does. and is just an amazingly creative mind. I love Kevin James. Yeah. So like, uh, and I've, uh, you know, I've supported him yes. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, as and, well because I saw his, he, I saw his uh, special talk. It was amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. But just, absolutely, when you, you've got to bring your own... Bring you to the trick. Is it, to the whole show. Yeah, yeah. Whole show. So I've got like my own magic words... Which yes, is, oh, yeah. oh my God, I've got like different ways. Like, and I, I, my style, which is really, I do a trick, I show people how, to, how it's done, but, but, but the, the pretend way. Right, right. And then um, you've got the reveal on the end. I've got the reveal at the end. I go, yeah. oh, that's beautiful. It suits mm -hmm. me down to a pat. Like, but um, I do love it. I, do, yeah. I love the whole. But see, world. you've already got you figured out, which is the key in magic. I was mm. talking to, you know, Peter Samuelson. Yep. He's a great magician. And I was talking to him uh, last time I was in the States. and. Well, and I see it with him too. We're talking about how the magic should be a vehicle to showcase you. Yeah, that's right. You know, right. as opposed to, wow, yeah. look what I just did. You yeah. want people afterwards to go, no, it's you that they're interested in. And, yeah. and But you've already got that coming in because you've already got you identified. You as a, as a comedian, you've already got your persona and who you are yep. is already stamped. So you've come at, coming up from a comedy angle, you've got that sword. Same with Amazing Jonathan. He already had, people are going to see yeah. Jonathan. They're yeah. not going to see him do the Bill and Lemon. They're not going to go see him <laughs> do the knife through arm. They're going to yeah. see him. Yeah, yeah. Or, or like a Copperfield. They're going to see a David Copperfield, not to necessarily yeah, see him right. vanish the Statue of Liberty or whatever. You know? yeah. so, and I think that's the key, that's the key yeah, to yeah. it. They're, they're coming to see you as opposed to see you doing yeah. the trick. And, and you yeah. get a good show on the side, which is a bonus, right? Yeah. And people have said, like, I, like I'm not sure because I'm just dabbling in it, mm. um, and I remember Jim Owen came with his with his family. He's oh, lovely. Yeah. He goes, mate, I was, I was one of the best shows I've seen. Like yeah. he really thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, God, I could see him laughing. His kids were enjoying it. Like this, the, so um, even on AGT, right? Like like the image, I just give it a go. Like I'm I'm now like, you know, because they say oh, you've got to practice, rehearse a trick for weeks, days, weeks, months. Now we, when I see a trick and it requires months of rehearsal, I'm out. No, I'm not interested. Yeah. Like, let me try it on stage because there's nothing like doing it live. Sure. And you might stuff up, but I'm not scared of that. Yeah. That's the difference. I'm not scared of that. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you roll work. with it. I'm yeah. the world's best worst. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, I'm the worst one, right? But uh, at the age of T, I remember like thinking, oh, you know what would be good? If I walked on stage with a shopping trolley and the tricks were in the trolley. Mm. How cheap and funny would that look? Mm. So the, the, just like, off the rack. Off the rack. And then we just we ran around, we found one like, you know, behind the theatre somewhere, bang, we just, and we brought it in, it was, it was brilliant. Nice. It was coming up with a shopping trolley. <laughs> <laughs> it's on wheels, it's perfect really when you think about it. And how did you find the whole AGT? Because you've, you, you've done a few reality shows, mm. and we all know of reality shows that it's very, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for, other than contrived, in terms of, it's very well, it set up, you it know, is. it's like, it, yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, like, you know, I mean, AGT, I went on there, I did a seven minute sort of act. They mm. only showed two or three minutes. Mm. They really cut it down a bit. Um, I mean, I got four yeses. David uh, Williams. Um, the, yeah, from Little Britain. Yeah, he, he stood up, standing ovation. Yeah. Audience stood up, mm -hmm. standing ovation. I couldn't do any, no more. Yeah. Um, it was only semi-finals. No, I was out. <laughs> like, that's okay, because I, you know, I'm not supposed to win, uh, you know. Um, yeah, you want, you want the audience to to be voting for someone who's battling or some, some I had no backstory. You had no backstory. I had no backstory. <laughs> I'm going as the world's best, worst magician. What's your backstory? I have none. Because <laughs> I said, don't use my name, right? Yeah. Because so when I came out, Shane Jacobs said, hey, Tahi. I said, no, the world's best, worst magician. So I could have no, how could I have a backstory? Um, you could have just fabricated a sob story and you would have been through to the final. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, the you talk about your one-legged grandfather that oh, taught yeah, you your first trick. I know, and, I know, I missed that. And you, uh, would have been, you would have been straight through. But look, the whole experience was fun. It was actually fun. And it was, what was interesting was um, seeing people get really nervous and go, oh my God, like, you know. Uh, and I'm going, this, you should just be relaxed, enjoy it. Mm. Do you think this is a proper competition? <laughs> 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 All right, it's a little bit of a comedy, but like you know, they. I remember they um, 
they flew some magicians from Germany, professionals. Right. And they, like, what they can't control, like, AGT, whatever you like, but they can't control the judge's comments and how they vote. Mm. I mean, to a certain degree. Like so, so they can set and position someone within the, within the show to perhaps be advantageous to them? If they perhaps, think that they're going to have the right backstory, have the right yeah, 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 appeal yeah, 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 to yeah, go yeah, the yeah, distance. Of course, of course. But, but the judges, though, that they're not aware if of... If you come out on stage and you don't perform, mm. you're going to get four crosses. Mm. And there's nothing they can do about that. Like, so these guys, professionals from Germany, from Germany turned yeah. up and whatever happened, it didn't work. And all the judges said, no, no, no. Right. And they were backstage gutted. Really? Gutted. And, and right. you're there with your shopping trolley about I'm to go, the shopping trolley. Right. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, guys. Bad luck, but I'm about to get a standing <laughs> ovation. <laughs> Check this out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the whole thing was fun. It was, yeah. it, was really, it was really enjoyable. Like the Jungle Show, loved it. One of the best experiences of my life. I often think about, I still remember the smells, the, the fire, the, the heat, mm. the noises. It mm. just always brings a smile. Some of the contestants and friends, that I made, it just brings a smile. It, just, it was yeah. brilliant. And I think that missed the trick with me because I was genuinely scared of heights and a lot of different things. And but again, you... it's who they choose. Sure. They say audience, is it? I don't know. Like, but, sure. Uh, well, we know Akmal's experience on, yeah, uh, on experience, that. Yeah, so, so. I was, even uh, when I was crossing bridges, I was like, this is scary. Yeah. The people thought I was just clowning around being, being an idiot, like, mm. which is normal for me, but I was actually generally scared of the heights. Mm. So I was on my hands and knees going, this is, just for crossing a bridge. Yeah. It wasn't even a challenge. So, <laughs> so they, and I'm scared, and I'm, uh, I didn't get to eat anything disgusting. I would have been absolutely, if they put me in some of those challenges, they would have got some good TV, I'm telling you. Mm. That, and the scary, because like, it would have been genuine, mm -hmm. not, not put on. I'm very scared of heights and the smells, and, and but, coriander came into the camp one night because they knew. Oh, they knew you hate I coriander. Think, I think they knew. And then so I, many times you and I have been out for lunch or dinner oh, and you just got to make sure, excuse me, no coriander, don't, no, 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 not even on the side. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's clearly says it, like yeah. uh, no coriander. Like I laugh when it says on my name tag. Um, but came in and I went like, yeah, berserk, I had the smell and I couldn't. And then I said, uh, yeah, I'm part of a face group, face, uh, Facebook group, which I am, and Instagram, I hate coriander. Mm -hmm. right? Where does that come from? Like, did you have too much of it when you were a kid, or no? It... No, there's a gene. There's an official. Like, it's it's proper. Oh, so it's bi biological. Yeah. yeah. So I think they said about I don't know what sort of percent, ten or twenty percent of the, of the humans have that gene, where right. it makes coriander taste like mud, smell like I could even when I was young kid supermarket. What's that disgusting smell? Really. And some people love it, right? It's a herb. It's a fresh herb. It's not like sure. I, I I love mint. I love parsley. Yeah. Coriander, no. Right, so it's just, we've got it. We've got the gene. It was right. officially, and then... When did, a, when did you discover that about well, the gene? Well, later on. Like, right. yeah, I mean, I haven't been tested. I just assume I've got it. Like, <laughs> You're self-diagnosed. I'm not going to go te get a test. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so me, I know enough to, to know. Anyway. Yeah, I know when I smell it, I'm going to go the other way. I can smell yeah. it from, you know, miles away. Yeah. Like, um, so then I, was, I said, oh, I'm part of a Facebook group, and, and I hate coriander. There's over like, there's like two or 300,000. On this right. group. And they hear, they hear me say it on national television and their numbers go up. Right, right. So, right. so you uh, should be a spokesperson. Well, for they them, want to send me some merchandise. <laughs> like, they want, can we send you some t shirts? I hate coriander. Yeah. And coriander ruined my meal. Yeah. Like, it's just all these sort of things. So, um, yeah, look, the whole experience, brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, loved it. But you, when you're. But, this is what I this is what I admire about you. You always make the best out of a bad situation, oh. and so like we've been down to the snow many times, oh. and you, you you don't like the cold, the snow, the, no, you don't no. ski. I don't but, ski, but you know you went. Hey, I'll give it a whirl. You yeah, know we were down there, yeah. but you and I just basically hang out and explore during the day the when we're down at the snow because yeah. we, we we have that we have that thing where neither of us will do the run of gigs uh, shows down at the snow unless. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, unless yeah. we go together. So we always get booked together. We it's go down there. We, we know all the places to check out, yeah. all the places to, um, all the different tourist sites. But we go to the, like, the, hy uh, the Hydro um, Museum, oh, we, the Snowy yeah. Hydro Project. Well, that's why, because we, we, love, we love history. We love to explore. Um, so we're in the same wavelength for a lot mm -hmm. of stuff. So we love it. Let's go, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a thing. Let's go check out this we museum. We explore the let's James Bond house in yeah, Threadburg. Yeah, yeah. And, and oh, 
<laughs> and then we have memorable experiences like we, we did that gig up in Perisher, um, up at the Sun Deck. Yeah. And afterwards, we, we, we get in that hands over snow, which is like this oh, buggy oh. that travels through the snow, takes yeah. you back down to the car. And I remember on this drive, you were telling me as we're driving, I've had this car since it was brand new. <laughs> this is the most reliable, is true. reliable car. I've had. You, like you're talking up yeah, the yeah. car big. Yeah. And we get back down to the car, we get into and it's a blizzard, right? It is like yeah. sub-zero. Yeah. And we get into the car, you turn the ignition, it doesn't kick doesn't over. Start. Doesn't so, so tell us what happened with the, with the guys that uh, well, ended up coming we, to the we, rescue. There was, there was hardly anyone left in the ma massive car park there at yeah. Perisher. And it's freezing and it's not turning over. I'm freaking out. Obviously, it was so cold, the car just said, no, nah, I'm not starting. <laughs> right? Something happened. And there's hardly anyone there. Like, so I'm going, but this, we're going to be stuck, we're going to freeze closed. to Everything's death. Everything's closed, like, yeah. Yeah, we're going to freeze to death. It's going to be on the news. <laughs> Two comedians make a big room laugh and then we'd freeze to death. <laughs> um, and then luckily some people that were at the show were sort of about 10 metres, 15 metres away. They could sort of look over and they saw we were in trouble. And they come over and they said, you guys need a hand? We go, yeah, we do. Like, we, we, we don't know what, we, we're not mechanical. I don't yeah. know what's going on. So these guys were, two guys, so they popped the bonnet. They start looking, and then we got out, right? And it was so cold. I remember it was so cold. Because we were both sitting in the car, thinking, yeah. feeling bad, thinking they're out in the no, cold. No, no, but we're... it was so cold, we actually went back into the car. <laughs> remember? And then we sat in the car. It was like in unison, though. We both opened yeah, yeah, the door yeah. and then slammed the door to get, they'll be fine. They're, so they're, we're in good. the car sitting there while these two volunteers, helpers, assistants, or, or, like come to our aid. We're in the freezing with a bonnet, we're mucking around. I don't know who knows what they were doing. Um, so they muck around in the engine, and then we looked, we said, we should get out. Remember that? We, we, we said, we should get out, and just not that we could do anything. Right. So we got out again and looked, and, and we could offer no assistance at no, all. No. Um, and eventually we got back in the car, thing, and then finally they said, start it now. Kicked it over. Thank they, God. They, they were like archangels. Oh my God. They Guardian kicked angels. It over, kicked it over. And, and they followed us. They thought, we'll I make know, sure they're safe. And you're, you're driving like, oh. and this is the most pathetic crash in the history of crashes, I think. You're driving along and you're like, oh no, no, I've lost traction. And, the, and we're only going like 5Ks an hour. You go so slow. And, you just, and the car just veered off the road and just went, boof, into this ditch. <laughs> and then, well, it, was, it was like a road like that. And so the main road and just a, just a little, little sort of uh, ditch on each side of the road. Yeah. It wasn't severe or anything. No. There was snow. On, on sort of a little bit of thing. And then they, they go, we'll follow you, just make sure everything's good. So I was just going slow to make sure the battery can kick in. I don't know, I heard that somewhere. And I was going, and then we, the, the tires just lost grip, right? <laughs> and we sort of slid off. It was so slow, and then we went in the ditch. They saw it all. <laughs> they go, these guys are the two biggest idiots. <laughs> First of all, couldn't help, you know, couldn't start the car. Now they just slide into a ditch. I think they just drove past us. They did. They just left them in bucket this. We can't help these guys <laughs> yeah, yeah, anymore. Yeah, you're on your own, but We can't help these guys anymore. And it's just so funny. Oh, my God. And, they, and we went back down, of course. And there's so but many. You've you got uh, a real fear of, uh, of animals jumping in front of the car, oh, too. So we're, we're driving like about 20 down the yeah. hill from, from Perisher back down to Jindabai. And we're just in the glowing eyes. Oh, <laughs> and you're like, there it is. There it is over there. And you're like swerving back come. over. And, and, and the, but we're going so slow <laughs> as, as the kangaroos <laughs> is watching us drive by. I can't relax. Yeah. Like when we're doing those gigs up there, like high up in the, in the, in the mountains, like this, yeah. or in my head, and this is true, I'm doing the gig, I'm doing it, and everyone's laughing. Mm. But, but I'm thinking, I've got to get back in the car. In I'm the worried. back of your mind. Yeah, yeah, I'm worried. I'm thinking, and, and it's weird, like, because I'm saying the words, I'm doing the shows, and but that's what's in the back of my mind. Mm. What about, we should, you know, we should give them that story. Um, we drove back from down the coast, you and I. I think we dropped off Akmal somewhere. And I don't know, and then we're driving, I think you were driving me back. Uh, I, was, I was living, I think I was St. George's in, Basin was the show that we were doing with Akmal down there one night. Down, down it was, it was about, what, ages away. Ages, yeah. uh, but I, was, I think I was staying in Monavale that day, yes. so we we'll come back. And then you drove the whole. I was in the passenger seat, and then you did the right thing. You said, "Listen, I'm," and I was feeling good. Yeah. And you said, "Listen, I'm feeling a bit tired because you drove about four or five hours." Mm -hmm. So we got to uh, around Saint Ives, Mount of it's, it's pretty bushy around there, mm -hmm. right? So it's pretty bushy. <laughs> and you go, "Listen, man, would you like you know you did the right thing?" You said, "I'm getting a bit tired. Would you?" I said, "Yeah." Because I'm feeling really good, which I was. And you're like, we haven't got that far to go. We haven't got that far to go. I said, I'm feeling good. I'll drive. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. up uh, Monavale, like, 
so we, we changed seats and you are really tired now. Mm. And, uh, and Joel, like we were talking, laughing. So Joel now sleeps. So you go back in the seat, the hat's down like this, and you're sleeping. Now I've got no one to talk to, right? <laughs> and as soon as that happened, this wave of tiredness came <laughs> over me. It's the only way to describe it. It just hit me like a brick. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm feeling really sleepy now. And I've just taken over 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I've been sitting in the passenger seat and you're asleep. And I think, you know what? I've got to do the right thing. I can't, I don't want to, we go in the bush. There's different, like, you know, it's just, there's a bit of freeway like there. So I decided to pull over, right? <laughs> it's bushy on the left, you know, left hand side of the road. Safe, but it's, there's bush and things around us. And I'm sleeping, right? And the funniest thing was your point of view, right? <laughs> your perspective. It's the funniest thing. This is a true story, by the way. We're not making this up. And because from Joel's point of view, he's going, would you mind driving? And he hears, yeah, I'm feeling really good. He sleeps. He goes, yeah, no worries. It's only a short distance. I'm feeling really good. And then he wakes up, bush dark, looks over the driver, and I'm sleeping. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just woke up. I didn't know where the hell we were. <laughs> right. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> and you're just passed out. <laughs> and we're, the thing is, we're only 10 minutes from I your know, house. I know, I was so tired, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't, I go, I was really like the droopy, the funniest perspective. Yeah, perspective. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm oh, good. No problem, I'll get us home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you look around and... <laughs> Oh, we've had, a, uh, we've had a lot of stories. Yeah. Sandy stories and, and there's tours. A and, of those. Oh, there's a plethora of those. Yeah, it's got to be in a book one day um, uh, if we get that far. Like, but, um, yeah, it's always a pleasure when you're touring with someone that's on the same wavelength. We always talk about a lot of fun things to talk about. There's no uh, sense of tension or anything at all. No, you know? like, never. There's nothing worse. As, that's the whole point. I, I'm not, yeah, you, you don't want to be in a car for eight hours driving with no, someone that's... You, anywhere. You're not, you, yeah. Yeah, let alone. Well, you've got to check yourself or what am I going to say? They're just sure, relaxed sure. and you know, it's good. Just let it and flow. We, we did the snow. We came up with our TV show, yes. The Snowy People. Yes. Got a great treatment and um, we did something out of it. So, like, hopefully uh, the show will be picked up by a smart production company or network. And then I'm sure we'll get plenty of stories out of that. We will. We will. We know where it started from. <laughs> our trips weren't wasted. Yes. Now, when did you actually move out here to Australia? What age? Okay, what age? Um, I've got two, two, two different birthdays okay. and years. And uh, look, if you're born overseas, it's it's a common thing. Like that in, like, you know, in the seventies. You think in Turkey in seventies, they're all about like getting the birth certificate. They're going to be bothered. Like they, you're often you're often born. It's happened in Lebanon, a lot of different countries as sure. well. And then at some point later on. They'd go register you, or, or sometimes they even register early. It was really weird. Right. Like, it's a, um, so I've never been a big birthday. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, don't it doesn't worry me. Yeah. Just, no, I don't. Uh, it was in the seventies, three or four years old. Right. Came out, and um, we settled in Melbourne first. Dad didn't like it. Hated it. Straight up to Sydney. Too cold. I just yeah, he didn't like it. It was I think it was in a hostel, and he goes, "No, this is not for him." He was right. he was a tailor. He had a you know, they come for an opportunity. And mo like most migrant parents, they've, they migrated to Australia, uh, wasn't on the premise of permanent, even though they have permanent you know, migration. Residency, yeah. But this is common for a lot of migrants. I don't know if you know the story, but they all justify it by saying, we'll go for a couple of years only, hmm. make a bit of money. Come back. And then go back. How else, what, how else would you do it? Yeah. Well, you're in Turkey, all your family, your brothers and sisters, your parents and everyone you know, your lifestyle. And this goes, when I say this goes for every other country mm. like that people have migrated. You, and, and what? Go to the other side of the planet where you know nobody, no. mm. you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you know nothing. Mm. How could you justify it? Because mm. when, when I thought about it, I thought, yes. And um, something I was, I was researching, like, you know, for my book eventually when it comes out, big scoop. Um, but I thought, yeah, that's the only way to justify it. And it makes total sense. Let's go for a couple of years, make a bit of money, and you bring it back, and they can better your lives, mm. better our kids' lives. They did it for the kids. Now, that's the genuine intention, or do you think that's what some people said because it was hard to break away from no, the family? No, that's a genuine intention. Genu right. That's a genuine intention. Like, right. and, and hats off, like, people go, oh, who are your heroes? Your parents. Yeah. Like, I mean, how could you go past your parents? Like, I mean, you know, if you had, like, decent parents, and mm -hmm. um, they are it, especially if... You know, the, the parents have migrated. 
to another country. It's when I think in their twenties they decided this. Mm. To, uh, with a family too. With it's a family with yeah. young kids, with twins, wow. all sorts of stuff. It's incredible. Um, but of course, when you come, the reality is you start working. Which you know they came to work. They got jobs in factories and worked hard and saved. And before you know it, they bought a house. Um, even though people said, "Oh, it's too risky. Don't do it." But my parents are risk takers. I guess mm -hmm. that's what comes from me. Like they just. Yeah, they just roll the dice, like, you know. My mum buys new stuff from the supermarket, even though she doesn't know what it is. <laughs> uh, what's that? I don't know, it's new. I haven't said that before. <laughs> and so I do that now. So yeah. I've got this inclination. If something's new, I've got to try it. Yeah. You know, oh, it's a new Kit Kat with mint. I've got to try it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, once reality hits and then you start working and, and you start saving, you've got a house, and then before you know it, the kids start school. Before you know it, 10 years has passed. Uh, mm. And they've gone back a few times. They've sent money back, help help people out, help their family out. Um, and before you know it, 20, 30 years passes. Sure. And you're here, and this becomes this is your country. Yeah. And and what a country! Like it's, I mean, I think like they could have gone to Germany because a lot of Turkish people migrated to Germany easily. Mm. Mm. It would have been it would have made more sense. It's closer, a lot more Turkish communities and people. My, my dad, not nah, we're going to the other side of the planet. Incredible! What a decision! What a man! Yeah. Um, so and and it's funny because how would your life been different? I would have been growing up in Germany. I would have known Turkish, German, and English probably. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Three languages. Would I have done comedy? Who knows? Maybe you'd become an engineer or something. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know about that. But like, who knows? I'm, I'm, and I, I probably would have found the arts somewhere because it's in your blood, right? I sure. just um, and I could have been touring all around Europe and. <laughs> but here I'm touring Australia, all the states. That's big enough. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's all. I, that's what happened. And uh, we just grew up in Sydney. And hardworking parents did, you know, saved, worked hard, two jobs, um, and uh, yeah, they did it all for the kids. And Incredible. Do you, do you think that that was the quality that they instilled in you to be a hard worker? Because you you work hard. You're always got something going on that you're. I love working you're on working. different projects. I love, yes. but it doesn't seem like hard work to me because I love what I'm doing. Mm. So I'm loving comedy. I love writing. I love uh, pitching, creating live stage shows, mm -hmm. live productions. I love it. So because you've got yeah. TV shows up in the past, like numerous TV shows mm. that you, you've got up in the past, which just. To, to get a development deal is a huge thing, but to get two on major yeah. channels, you know, it's, yeah, a, it's, it's a, a huge accomplishment just to, to create, write, and produce, yeah. you know, It's funny because he, he came to Habib's was sitting on my laptop for 10 years. Mm. I remember, like, writing it after one of the stage shows, this, oh, this concept, and uh, it was two and a half pages. Bang, it just sat there. Mm. Every now and then I'd come back, oh, yeah, we can do this and do that. And eventually... My mate Rob Shahidi, you know, good, yeah. good mate of mine, of course. We've done a lot of stuff together. Um, I love the big boy, you know. And uh, I said we should do something. And 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 he had a he uh, knew a, a guy from a production company, mm -hmm. Ben Davies, and that's how it all started. Yeah. And then because the idea was fairly simple to understand, which is important for the executives, um, and it was fresh, it was a bit unique. It just took off. Like, but I feel the networks they don't take enough risks these days. Yeah, it's a different right. environment. They just they copy stuff from overseas. They don't. Right. I, I don't know. It's just it's my feeling. and people are, uh, they're they're uh, enjoying they're devouring their TV differently. Mm -hmm. They're streaming. There's downloading. There's yeah. YouTube, do do there's the people internet. sit down and just watch? Like you know the numbers just sitting down and watching commercial TV. Less and less these days. Mm. Less and less. The numbers are going down. And, and obviously uh, the big reality shows work. That's why mm -hmm. they go on that. But um, yeah, they're, they're they're consuming it differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. They've got to change, and I feel like they're not changing fast enough. Right, change like even the the way you accept, even the budgets, change it up. Mm -hmm. Like you know, um, not everything is has to be that expensive or that cheap, and it should be able to. It should be more fluid. To you, I feel there's a concept for uh, I've mentioned this to you before mm. for a show or a or a film that would work. Your return to Turkey because you have not been back to Turkey, and the reason for that is I haven't done the army service. So you, technically, <laughs> you would be conscripted into the army if you went back to Turkey. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, be. and uh, uh, you can pay and get out of it, but I, I just refuse. And I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm not going to join a war. Sure. Right? Uh, there's but, no way. Can you right, imagine me? <laughs> but that that right there is the concept. You as a comedian returning to Turkey, and yeah. you get enrolled into the army, and yeah. there, there's your film premise right there. 
me, uh, uh, my my two brothers and myself, three of us, <laughs> right? Bang. Yeah, it's like the three stooges the, the in the, in boys the go Turkish back, Army. You know, yeah. uh, uh, middle-aged boys go back. Um, SBS should be all over this, right, really. Right. And say, yeah, we we follow the like, cameras. But would that actually, like, they actually, they actually would en enlist you in the army? Like, yeah, they would, yeah. There's, right. no, there's no age barrier. Right. And, and because I've got a degree, right, I, I was a teacher. Yes. I go in as an officer. Right. So I'd kick my two brothers around. <laughs> I'd love that. Just that, that alone would be funny. <laughs> right, peel those potatoes, come on. Yeah. <laughs> like, but not a lot of people know that you were a school teacher as well, a drama yeah. teacher. I sat on you stage. Study, you, you study drama. And... People laugh, like, yeah. they, which fair enough. Um, and then, you, you got an academic background. Yeah, they go, and when I say I was a teacher, they go, and they, they, like often another question could be, so you actually went to uni, university? Uh, no, no, I just went to a school and just applied for a job. And they just say, yeah, come in, come in. We're going to, uh, vacancy right here. Yeah, of course. Like, um, but they were great years too, they were really, really good years. Um, but yeah, that would be a good show. I think that SBS should be all over it. But yeah. Of course, ah, oh, yeah. I think SBS are changing. They're, they've gone away from their uh, their identity. Right. Okay. Like, like you know, they're a very multicultural right. station, but now it's not as much. And mm. when it comes to the youth, you know, from when you're a mm. when you're a kid, there's a lot of things that I feel that within this podcast that yep. people have held on to from when they were from when they were younger, their favourite things, especially. And I want to start off with your favourite album today on this podcast. Favourite album? None other than classic. It's Elvis Presley. Like this is a huge Elvis fan. Um, should I hold it like this? Am I? Uh, I, feel how, like I'm, I feel like I'm selling a product. <laughs> okay. Now, however you want to hold it, you can. Read the it number down. below and order <laughs> two for the price of one. <laughs> this is uh, yeah, Joel Osborne direct. <laughs> um, so yeah, massive. We, we got fan. pop plants. We got everything. We'll we'll send it yeah, all. Yeah, everything. The pop plant. Everything must go. Um, Elvis. Uh, lo you know, I'm like. You know, one of many, many millions and millions of fans. Mm. Um, love the person, love his story once I found out. When it, I mean, I loved his music and look when I was younger, right? But uh, once you, you delve a bit deeper, Peter, mm. I realised this guy was a pioneer. Yeah. Absolute pioneer. They, they don't realise, like, they go, when they say he invented rock and roll, there was nothing before him. Mm. There's nothing to compare it to. Mm. There, there, there was nothing. Not, not in the mainstream. You no, know, you had, yeah. you had, like, your, your, your um, Chuck Berry's, yeah, your, but your Little Richard's butt. A white guy doing, well, what can we say? Like, you know, black music. Black music. Well, it was Chuck Berry that said Elvis opened the door for black musicians. That's right. But that's a massive, like, you can't just, uh, you know, gloss over that. Right. Like, like, this guy, they thought he was, like, you know, I don't think he was white when yeah. I heard his music. Um, and then the way he fought and, and also his moves and people thought, oh, this guy's a devil. Mm. And the uh, teenagers were going crazy and the parents were going, no, this guy... Don't like just shake a hip or swivel. Now it's nothing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And they it went to the point where they actually filmed him from uh, waist, waist up, up on the Ed you know? Sullivan show. But he did yeah. so much. He did so much, and he came from absolute poverty. Yeah, Tupelo, absolute Mississippi. Poverty. Yeah, the house was just basically it was just one room, mm -hmm. uh, no money. And when he made it, like he never wore jeans again. Mm -hmm. Always never because he thought jeans were for um, the working class. Working class. Yeah. Well. Tracks with me. <laughs> but, um, and yeah, just his rise and, and then he did the army service, mm -hmm. unlike me. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't take that leaf out of his book. He went there and, and, he, and he, he had the comeback as well. And uh, he was a serious actor as well, which he did, you know. It, it, but that's, that's the sad thing, like later in his career, he wanted to be a serious actor, but Colonel Tom Parker pushed him into these roles that he just saw as making more money, getting more of a return hey, on. It was a million and bucks a movie. West Side Story. Yep. They wanted him for West Side yep. Story. He wanted to do it, and the colonel talked him out of doing it. Million so what does he do? Clam bake. Clam bake. Yeah. Uh, girls, girls, girls. I yeah. mean, million dollars a movie. Uh, yeah. It was just beautiful. Like, it was easy money, and it was just a cookie-cutter approach. Yeah. And he actually got depressed during that, all, all those sure. Hollywood years, and sure. he really wanted to perform. He loved gospel music. He loved to perform after the shows. Mm. This is one of the favourite things. I don't know if like people know. Like, uh, by the way, uh, so Joe is Pazito, his best friend. Yes. Who best man at his wedding? Best man at his wedding. Um, so a friend of ours uh, met him uh, and brought him out to Australia, and so a friend of Rob and myself. Right. Um, mutual friends, of course. Rob and I were there because we're big. Rob's a big Elvis fan as well, so we were, we were there. We got to meet him, 
and, and hang out with him. Hang and, out with him, yeah. Giving us stories, and we filmed him and all sorts of different stuff. And but we just hanged out, and he was just um, he was great to hang out and just to hear the stories. And someone that was there and saw actually the there, meteoric rise, saw yeah. everything that you know. Met him uh, while during his in, in Germany, right? In Germany, that's right. The army service became good mates. Yes, and then basically everyone said, just hang around with me and become my right hand man. He basically wow. was. He was always there for the big moments, and. Uh, you know, Joe Esposito lived across the road from John, the amazing Jonathan. Yeah, in that's Vegas. An incredible fact. I, like, I, I was so, and I, I'm like, what? Joe Esposito's a great. And he says, yeah. He goes, I had to break into his place, and I'm like, what the? F-? He, I know. Jonathan's because Joe took yeah. off, and his garage door was closed, and Jonathan's cat went in, and the garage door closed. Jonathan's on the cat. Every- on the cat. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Jonathan, <that's> not- <laughs> Jonathan's looking everywhere for the cat. Yeah. And he's hearing the meowing across the road as he's walking around. He goes up and he thought, well, you know, I got to get my cat out, so. You know, he broke into Joe's house to, to get his... I wonder if there's some Elvis memorabilia. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so um, he's saying stories and all sorts of different stuff. Like, I mean... That's phenomenal because Joe's passed now. But, oh, he has passed. But, like, but to, to someone like that to sit down and chat who had was a direct through line to this oh, it, incredible, not only person, but era in American music and culture. Absolutely. Even personal stories. Like when uh, he told us when Elvis got... Uh, he, he decided to get married to Priscilla, drop mm-hmm. of a hat, like m- middle of the night, mm-hmm. massive megastar. So middle of the night, uh, Joe goes, okay, we gets woken up, we got to, all of a sudden we're going to go to Vegas because that's where they, it's 24 hours, you can sure. get married at any time of the night. That he, like So they decided to go, like, I don't know, the plane goes in the middle of the night, like just land there and they, they dress up and mm. um, go to do their vows. And of course, uh, it was like, uh, I remember Joe said it was like $15, Right. You got to pay the, you know. Right. And Elvis, he said Elvis didn't have anything on him. He didn't carry a dime. He never carried any money. So Joe was the one who had to go. Oh, okay. I've got fifteen <laughs> bucks. Joe paid for his yeah, wedding. Yeah, Joe paid for his wedding. Yeah. So little stories like that. I wonder really. if Elvis knew in that moment that he would be creating a whole industry of Elvis marriages in Vegas. I know. It's, 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 probably right. not. Like it's just you know those sort of things you don't think about it like at the time, but of course. Right. Um, but so much stuff and. The, the comeback was amazing. Oh, the 68 um, comeback special. The, the special but was what, what I love yeah. about that special is that he, people like Scotty Moore uh, on guitar and DJ Fontana, his drummer, his original band members that were on that album, yep. they did like a little unplug session in the round yep. on that 68. And that's one of my favorite parts of the 68 comeback special, where they're doing songs from that album. And Elvis is just letting rip on it. Like he's got this gravelly yeah. rock and roll edge to him Absolutely. With, with those songs. You know what else he told us? Which, you know, a bit of a, like, I haven't uh, told this to many people. Like, uh, I don't know if people know, but they did the comeback in the studio, right? And so they went about two, three days earlier, as you said, like, let's have a bit of a jam, check mm. it out. And Elvis, Joe, Joe uh, telling us this, mm. loved it so much. The, the, the feeling of coming back, mm. the, the, the he, he knew what he, the leather suit he was going to wear, and the vibe, the energy of the band, he actually didn't leave. Well, he just stayed in the studio. He stayed in the studio for two or three days. What, just slept there? Just and... slept there, wouldn't leave. Huh. Would not leave the, because uh, he didn't want to lose the feeling, the magic. That energy. That, the energy. Yeah, right. So he actually stayed there for two or three days, wow. would not leave the studio. So Joe said we had to get him stuff and bring, like, you know, Bring in a bed. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't leave. and so and then he, they got everyone in and he did it and it was just mm. magic. It was absolutely magical. Yeah. And, but, yeah, and and you can see which I've seen with performers before that have had time off and come back, like there's this feeling I got I got to prove myself. Yeah, yeah, that's I've got to let everyone know. And that was like, big for him. And and, for, and you see it in that performance. You see he's edgy when he comes out at the beginning yeah, yeah, of that yeah. performance, but then once he kicks into it, bam, it all comes back. And he, he wasn't sure how the audience would react. Was was the love still there? Because he, 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 he hadn't he performed misses. live in many years. And when yeah. he got the love back, he was just he just couldn't. And I felt like the um with the latest Elvis, Elvis movie, they missed a bit of that. Like you know, what mm. I mean, I was disappointed in certain parts of that. Uh, you know. Because uh, I know a little bit more about the whole, because I've done a lot of research on Elvis and everything, sure. like his old. But um, they, yeah. missed, they even brushed off, like, you know, when he did the show in Hawaii. Yes. That was huge. Massive. Massive. Yeah, satellite like, around the world. That's it. And yeah. then uh, in the movie, it was like uh, quick. It was part of a montage. A quick part of a montage. Going, yeah, hang on, I, hang I, on. I understand. Yeah, I yeah. get what you're saying. And, and also, too, I felt. I felt that the guy, um, um, was it Butler, Justin? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, um, I just know his Butler. Yeah, yeah. He, was lovely. he looked great and yeah. he did a great job. I though. thought he was great as Elvis. He did a great job. I, I thought he played that part. But I felt, 
I felt <laughs> we, we just know his surname. People are going, oh, his yeah. name. We should look at that. Yeah. But he he's um, he was given some great performances in that. Yeah. But I just felt from a um, directing and editing point of view. There were so many cuts in those scenes. Yeah. It's like in some of those scenes, hold the camera on him. Do yes. this do the slow zoom, you know, yeah. or, 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 or slow pan in the shot and just hold it on him. He's given some yeah. A class delivery on this, but with so many cuts here and there, it just felt uh, it took me out of the moment a lot. Yeah, you know? I, I, I agree with you. And and they also uh, Colonel Park was made to look a lot more evil than what he was. Mm. No matter what you say about Colonel. And yes, he drove Elvis to the movies, uh, doing all those movies. Mm -hmm. He didn't let him perform overseas mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons. Uh, it can be speculated. But you got to hand it to the guy who was a brilliant promoter, mm -hmm. manager and marketer. Mm -hmm. No matter which way you like. Even right. Tom Hanks said we did make him look uh, a bit more evil than what he was. Right. Even, he, well, even, even he admitted it. Now, right? did Joe Esposito talk about Colonel? Did he oh, have uh, a view? The, what the, was his? The, the guy was a genius. So like, Joe respected him. Oh, Joe was... uh, no matter what you thought of him. Yeah. He was a genius, mm -hmm. marketing genius, like having uh, the, the, the ushers wear sort of clothing, the merchandise, mm -hmm. the, the promotions. Um, you know, the colonel just uh, really managed every little detail of it. Right. And, uh, and he knew he was on a winner, right? Sure, sure. But even, uh, so, especially in Hawaii, let, let, let me go back to the special because I remember Joe saying a few things ago. One, first time done in history, again, that's massive, like a satellite show mm -hmm. worldwide mm -hmm. in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Like when's the last Unheard time? Of. When's the last time anyone's done that now? Even mm -hmm. okay, we do it on the internet, like just and they can release. But they don't really do that. Where there was a, over a billion people. So at that stage, I think there was five billion people in the world, or uh, four or five. So we're talking 20, 25 percent of the world mm. tuning in to this event. It's incredible. And also because back then of technology, this is Joe saying it again. Again, so this is just valuable information for the listeners. This is where you come to this podcast if you want to <laughs> learn this sort of stuff, right? Uh, he said the satellite was exactly one hour. So they had to fit everything within that 60 minute to time the hour. Frame. To the hour. So he said everyone is panicking mm. except for Elvis. Mm. So everyone's going nuts. They're panicking. How are we going to do this? And Elvis was, he goes, mate, he was the only one that was relaxed. He was calm and he did the show and he finished exactly to the second. Mm. Like literally to the second, like, but he knew the songs, he knew the time, mm -hmm. he kept the nine and he finished his that because it was once the satellite cut off, that was it, man. Right. Joe goes, that was it. It was, it was it, you know, so these guys were really panicking because now they see But um, to do a worldwide show like that, that is just incredible. And I, I do remember when he uh, passed, I was just a little boy, and this was like, uh, I was living in Roseland. So 77. Yep, yeah, yeah. 77. Uh, living in Roselands, Sylvester Avenue, and and I remember because um, I was a little, little boy, but this one I remember like all the there was some girls up the street crying, right? Yeah, like because I remember his his oh. albums and different stuff like mm. at Roseland Shopping Center where mm. I grew up, and I go oh, yeah RCA records and all this sort of stuff, and mm -hmm. and we used to buy them, and like just it was, it was awesome. But um, I go wow, just different people crying, big news all oh. over the papers and mega news. And I go, wow, now that's someone who's had an impact worldwide. Yeah. There was, like, you see that classic footage in, in Memphis outside his, oh, outside yeah. Graceland. Yeah, yeah. And just the thousands of yeah. people, like even um, Bill Murray, uh, he, yep. he, I remember hearing him tell a story how he, he had to go. Like he had to fly from New York to, to Memphis to be there and to just be a part of wow. the, this mourning process for, for the king. Yeah, and yeah. He, and yeah, he was... Uh, yeah, he just felt he needed to be a part of that. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, Joe talks about uh, the, uh, the the death of Elvis as well. Like he, I remember he, um, and he's talking about it on this different because I've seen every video that's been released. Have you watched the the documentary series, the definitive? Do it's like an yeah. eight um, DVD I've seen set, yeah, yeah. and it was produced by Joe. Yeah, yeah, it's I've great. Seen it, like, uh, and uh, basically, it was it was so overwhelming that just they just took care of business. Um, yeah. uh, it's because he says, he, you know, I mean, but he did say like once, it, it, it took him a couple of months to realise that Elvis has passed. Mm. Because once it happened, it was so overwhelming. There's so much media, going on. So much going on. And then yeah, there's, there's no like, time to really mourn. Or, no time. Yeah. No time. And then he it, it, it said it hit him like three months afterwards. Mm. 
and that, oh, wow, he's really gone. This is something I find interesting about when they say about the Memphis Mafia, his, his, mm. um, his guys that would, you know, work for him, be his companions, hang around. People would often say, oh, you know, that they enabled him to be a drug user, this, that, yada, yada. And they sort of talk sort of disparagingly about it, about this core mm. group of people that were around him. But someone like Elvis, you know, he's not some guy who's going to be told what to do. And I've been around, yeah. you know, I worked yeah. for someone who had a drug addiction and drug problems. I, so I, I got a somewhat of an insight into knowing those sort of people with a big personality like that and a big um, ego, they, they're going to do what they want to do. You can talk Absolutely. until you're blue in the face. And I know the people that were in the Memphis Mafia that saw him, w w said to him, what one of them said, I, I can't watch you do this, Elvis. I I'm not going to be a part of this. And then he ended up um, leaving or getting fired. And then but Elvis said to his dad, I want you to rehire him w within, within you know, a month or so and put him back on the salary and everything. I don't, you know, don't want to lose him. And then Elvis passed away, and, but, so he you know, was never yeah, re well, reconciled. What are your thoughts on that, or what was Joe's thoughts on that? Well, the thing was, like, uh, Elvis, uh, all those people, uh, Elvis was supporting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. so he even, Very generous. He, he even admits this. Like he, so he was under pressure to keep doing those movies for a million bucks, mm -hmm. those concerts, which he loved, but, like, relentless shows because there was a lot of people who were supporting. His mm -hmm. entourage was massive. Mm -hmm. They were hangers on, but he loved that. He loved mates, he loved people hanging around. So one thing like is Elvis loved to, one of his favorite things was gospel music, of course, mm -hmm. and he loved to jam after a show, mm. right? So, but if he's paying your wage, see, he's calling the shots as well, right? <laughs> um, so that sort of stuff with Elvis, uh, you know, the, the members mafia, like uh, you can say what you like, but in the end he makes his own choices, right? right. He can, you know, I mean, Joe could say a few words, but he's, in the end he's gonna, do whatever he wants. Right. But um, so the show would often finish. This would be this would be their. Uh, this will happen nearly every day because like they're doing shows in Vegas day after day. So they would do the show, right? The after the show, they would go back to Elvis's room. There'd be piano. There'd be all sorts of, like guitar, and it'd be under. It'd be like required of the band to come back, including the backup singer. Everybody. And jam with him. And because he loved it. Yeah. That was his favorite thing. Yeah. Right? So, so they'd all be back and. We're talking jam for hours, right? Hours, like there'd be, and he'd love that. Was so his all favorite. hours of the morning? It'd be like four a.m., five a.m. And like these guys have jobs; they've got to get up in the in the day and actually get stuff ready and well, get take care of business. During the guys were tired. Yeah, but what can you say? Hey, officer, I don't want because they knew he loved it. Yeah, and, and the guy with the big deep voice didn't come back. It's not right, or someone else, or the other, like. So they all come back, and it was Elvis's favorite thing. The show finished, and they'd be jammed for like three a.m., four a.m., and then of course they'd be in bed late, fire, like, and they'd sort of all get up about 12-ish, mm. one o'clock in the afternoon, have something to eat, get themselves up, you know, and then eventually get ready for the show again, and then just repeat the whole process. Oh. You know, like that's why the blinds would be all covered, you know. Now, sort of have you been to Memphis, to Graceland? Never been. Really? Which is uh, something, I, obviously, I would love to do. Rob has. Yeah. And you know what? I'm a little bit sad because Joe has passed away. Mm. And he said, go with him and oh. we're trying to hook it up. And you get to go upstairs. Oh, my God. I know. Because when I was there, I, I, a know. I asked the lady, I said, does part of the tour go upstairs? And she said, please, sir, have respect. No one goes upstairs. But I was I, I didn't want to see, you know, the, the, the toilet that he carked it on. I'm just thinking, you know, I was just curious. Oh, does any of it go upstairs, yeah, right? I, I want to go upstairs and have a look around, look at the bedroom, yeah. look at this, go upstairs. Yeah. But Joe can go upstairs. Mm. He can go anywhere Which he wants. Which means you could have gone upstairs. No, he said, I'll take you upstairs. So, uh, uh, you know, it's a shame um, he did pass, but uh, and there goes my uh, upstairs visit. <laughs> As I, well. I went there with Billy McComb, the great Billy McComb, um, comedian, magician, and that you have the little headsets where you're walking around, yep. and each room you go into, you have a, giving a, a you know a narration of yep. where you are. And after like three quarters of walking around, I, I took it off and I'm, Billy, you enjoying it? It's really informative. And he says, yes, but it, none of this seems to be making sense to me. And we're like in the, in the, <laughs> in the kitchen. Yeah. And then and I listened to it and he goes, and as you can see in the paddocks outdoor here, the horses would roam through the, <laughs> so each room we're going into, he had a different recording. <laughs> He's going, this is what? Yeah. <laughs> what horses? <laughs> um, 
but yeah, look, it, I mean, I have to become friends with Priscilla. In, o- in order to get in, to yeah. Maybe, yeah, uh, somehow. But get like, uh, yeah, uh, but look, I, I, I'd love to go one. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think you'd love De- it. Definitely love on the uh, wish list. Yeah, and, and across the road from there too, when he's got all the cars and the Lisa Marie jet that you can go up on yep. and walk around and see the bed. and it's, The Heartbreak yeah. Hotel has been built, right? Right, yeah. yeah so, yeah. I mean, um, I think there's more. Uh, I mean, that was one of the older ones now, I think. Mm. But, um, yeah, I'll definitely tick it off, hopefully one day. Now, you have here an album that was um, recorded partly in, in Memphis. At yeah. So there's certain tracks on this album that were at Sun Records that Sam Phillips recorded. Yeah. And then other, al- other tracks that were RCA. With this album, I find interesting is how RCA tried to recreate the Sam Phillips sound, but had real difficulty yeah. trying to produce it like he did. Because there was a technique that Sam Phillips used called the slapback um, echo, yeah. where he'd use two different recordings and he'd, and he'd have one slightly on delay to give that, you know, that effect, that kind of slight delay echo effect. You know, he found out just by chance, like just trial and error. You know right, I mean? right. They're, they're, they're messing around, like, oh, hang on. But he created I like what an could, amazing. This could really work, like you know. And yeah. then they just, and he was, and look, he sold the rights, of course, to Elvis. And people say, oh, what do you do it for? But at the time, it was a lot of money. That was forty grand. So in the That's 19, in 1955, forty That's grand is insane. Like, yeah. it's life changing. He became well off after that, mm-hmm. and he did other stuff. And, and the other people that Sam Phillips produced as well were Jerry Lee Lewis, yeah, yeah. Um, Johnny Cash. Wouldn't yeah. they call it the Million Dollar Quartet? That's it. Yeah. Like, so people, you know, it's easy to look back now, but like at the time of his life, I mean, I don't know what it would be equivalent to these days, but it'd be millions, mm. right, back then, 40,000. 40, mm. um, but I love some of the old, like, on this track, Blue Moon. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, Haunting. It's, I love it. Yeah. It's beautiful, like just... Yes. And it was, but, I yeah. like some of the lesser ones. I like the main ones as songs as well, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, but some of the lesser ones I, I, I love that you don't get mm-hmm. that, you know? But people, the amount of songs, I, I should know the number of songs it's done. I think it's over. Uh, um, no, I better not give a number. Yeah. It's <laughs> a way off, but it's a lot. Uh, you know, and, and people are quite surprised. Mm. There's, there's some homework. That's, that's yeah. when I was a teacher, there we but go. I didn't know anything. You go, here's something you to, to go yeah. home and do. But I didn't know yeah. a question. Every teacher does the same trick. Do you know the answer to this? That's homework for you. <laughs> you tell me tomorrow. Classic teaching. Great way to get out of it. Teaching 101. Great <laughs> way to get out of it. Yeah, yeah. I, just on that, I know we're going to think, but um, I'm a good speller. I'm good with punctuation and, and thing. But my straight out of uni, first up, someone goes, oh, Sir, do you know how to spell lieutenant? Uh, that's a tough one, right? <laughs> lieutenant, okay. <laughs> Hang on. You'd, you'd find out how to spell it for me and you'd show me to the next day. <laughs> Lieutenant of all, the, of all the things. You know what I mean? So, yeah, look, classics. Um, yeah, the, the, the album, the songs, some of the lesser ones mm. are like, I wasn't a big, the, the little less conversation, which you really, really... Right after, yeah. Yeah, I was a big fan of that one. Yeah, like, you know, felt more, yeah. But uh, it, it's a bit... Yeah, I thought, oh, well, well, now... Trying I to bring what? Elvis into this day yeah, and age. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the, 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 this album though, it's interesting. It was the first number one rock and roll album on the Billboard charts, and it just blew up the whole industry. Like yep. basically, like after that, you had and, and you, you know, like you, a lot of these, like Carl Perkins, um, you know, Blue Suede Shoes, yeah, uh, Blue, yeah. That, that was on this album. Yeah. So he he was able to interpret other people's music, like like Sinatra could do. Could interpret other people's music. You know, Sinatra never wrote a tune. Elvis didn't write his tunes. But there was something far beyond that that no one else seemed to have, which was this element of uh, uh, people say about his looks. You know, talk about Elvis. He, he, he was big because of, he looked. Big. But there was something way beyond that. He had this presence and this there, there was. power, this energy to him that was unseen and unheard of. Unbelievable. They said that when he walked in a room, like when he when mm. he. Um, and of course, it was number one, right? But like this was, a lot of parents thought this was the devil, yeah, right here, evil, right <laughs> in my hands. Yeah. Do not, yeah, like you know, it, it, that's what it was like. It was just, and so there was all these uh, two forces working against each other as well. But right, um, but yeah, his magnetism, his and his voice actually got better mm. with age. Mm. It was unusual. Like, he didn't lose his voice. No, he lost but, his fitness, but he didn't lose his voice. Sure. sure. Well, no? you look at that late, later footage of him yeah. singing like uh, shortly before he passed. Haunting. And. 
It was like operatic. It's unbelievable. And yeah. he's overweight. He's sweating. He's out of you know. He's he's not in good condition. But the voice was still still there. Still there. Incredible. It, it, it's not better than ever. Right. Like it was incredible. Right. And that's why I love the versions that he did in the '68 comeback special uh, off of this album as well, yeah. because it was, he had a there was a gravel to his voice as well, but it was real like rock and roll. Yeah. And he was really pushing, and it was, yeah, it was uh, like you say, it improved over time. The best thing, like he was the king. Yeah. And undeniable. the original one, yeah. undeniable. Nothing like him before. Like yeah. nowadays we have pop stars and big names, but for in that time. You know, there, there were like big, there were big names in in entertainment, like during like Houdini was, was yeah. world renowned, or in sports like a Joe Lewis, the boxer. Everyone knew who Joe Lewis was yeah. in that day. But Elvis was like the first to come out in rock and roll music to, of that magnitude. Uh, absolutely, like when we people don't understand, like I mean, some people do, but like he was a pioneer. Mm -hmm. He was a pioneer, mm -hmm. and the best quote. Uh, there was a lot of different uh, artists, famous legends that said something about Elvis. John Lennon, mm. his quote, before, El before Elvis, there was nothing. Mm. Bang. Yeah. Summed it up in one line. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Bob Dylan, didn't, uh, he didn't speak for a week after Elvis died. He was just so mortified after his death. So all these titans of, of music yeah. that, you know, pay homage to... How great Elvis! Absolutely, yeah, Elvis. Absolutely. And, you, and you know what I always love? I love this cover. Like this cover that they used, um, the Clash recreated yeah. that for London Calling. Yeah. But what I what I really like about this is Elvis. You know, he he was marketed very much off his looks. But with this cover, he's, there's no pretty boy look going yeah, on yeah. there. And, and I felt that they really captured the essence of Elvis at that yeah. time on that cover. And like it would have been easy to put a photo of him looking glamorous and looking like a pretty boy, but this is like you know you can't even tell is that a good looking guy? Who knows? But he's but he's sort of it. You can tell, but like it, the simplicity of it. Yeah. The the the. I the mean, these, co these colors clash really when you think about it. Yeah. But it also stands out. Yeah. Because like they've got no other noise around. But it's know, like, for me, that album was always yeah. the essence of yeah, Elvis yeah. is in that cover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this one and the um, I also the other one I had with the RCA. Uh, the jump, sh the, the 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 jumpsuit. Yep. Yeah. And he's looking back like yeah. this. That one, like yeah. that album, was one of my favorites. Like I had, and that's been torn up and different stuff. Yeah. But like, um, yeah, classic, absolute classic. But you're right. You're right. The simplicity of it. Um, you're right. Who would that be the photo you choose for for an album? But it works. It works perfectly. It works perfectly. Exactly. The king. The original. The firstest with the mostest. I think. Uh, Bruce, uh, was it Bruce Springsteen? That? Yeah, that all these legends just had these quotes about him. The firstest with the mostest. Mm, mm. Bang, I love these quotes. <laughs> but John Lennon one, that's the one. Yeah. For obviously it was nothing. Well, speaking of classics, we're going to move on to your favourite movie. Oh. Which... Should I put them up like this or <laughs> I'll, put them, I'll put them down like that? Which is, uh, to, to me, is, a, is a, two, one of my favourites from my childhood. Yep. None other than... Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, or I, I used to go Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, because that's what they... Well, that was the name of the book. Name of the book. So, you know, a lot of times I've said Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Everyone knows it's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. But um, this, so my favourite... Yeah, Do you, you know, know why they called it Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Why? Because Quaker's Oats yep. financed this film. Really? I didn't know that. And they wanted Wonka in it because they were releasing the Wonka bar to coincide with the movie. So that's why they changed it from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. However, it was a disaster because the bars, was, they were new into the world of chocolate. Yeah. They all melted on the shelf. <laughs> so it was useless. Yeah. But we got a great film out of we it. Got a great film out of it, but it, it wasn't a bad idea in premise. Like, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, who came up with that? Colonel Tom Parker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this, um, this movie, right, uh, it's funny because like a lot of, you know, I think you mentioned this like, uh, and, uh, and on this podcast, a lot of movies have been chosen from people's childhood and mm. from back because I think it has a lasting impact. Like my favourite TV show, you never guess my favourite TV show, I know this is not the thing, but it's Lost in Space. Mm. Love Lost in Space, right? Because growing up as a kid, we that's what we watched. Mm -hmm. It was brilliant, it was comical, it was funny. And, you know, and this movie had an impact. Like, you know, I saw it as a kid and I thought, brilliant, mm. absolutely. Like the whole journey... The good, the bad, the evil, like I okay, got the lessons, the lessons, learn. and it just 
stays with you. Like it just really, I go, wow. Need- what a, you know, the, the, you know uh, being happy with uh, what you have, the poverty, the family living together. It freaked me out, those um, four grandparents sleeping in the one bed. Right. Like, you know, I'm, I'm For 20 that, years. I got 20 years. I got, now, I've, I've got this. I didn't even see a toilet. Did you see a toilet in the house? There must have been. <laughs> no, no, must I have think been. they had bedpans. The, like, yeah, could you yeah, imagine the stench yeah. in that place? Yeah. Poor Charlie. And I'm going. No oh. wonder he wasn't happy. <laughs> he wasn't happy, exactly. <laughs> yeah, was he up. sleeping? We never found out. No. Did he have his own, like, now, you know? I Because I, I, I watched that film a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. And I rewatched it. <laughs> Grandpa Joe. Yep. Yeah. I don't think he's the best guy in the, in the world. <laughs> what do you want? Because here we got a guy who's been bedridden for 20 years. Yeah. Charlie's out doing the paperwork, yeah. you know, doing the paper run. Yeah. Trying mom, to get some bread on the table. Yeah, trying to bring bread home. Yeah. Uh, Ch- um, Charlie's mum, she, she's like a, 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 she works in a laundry, washing yep. clothes, stir, yep. you know. Yep. Here he is, bedridden, weighted on hand and foot. Yep. Charlie wins a golden ticket. Who's on their feet dancing around? He's been, he was fit as a fiddle the whole time. He's scamming. Fit as a fiddle, didn't want to get up, maybe. And then even so, when, so, so here we got a guy who's waited on hand and foot, got everyone working for him. He's got a chance to yeah. go along to the chocolate factory. Suddenly he's up on his feet, dancing around, dancing. twirling about. Nothing wrong with him. Nothing wrong with Nothing this guy. Nothing wrong with him. He, he should have been on compo. He's a fraud. <laughs> he was, he's a fraudster. Yeah. He's, maybe he was on compo. That should, they should have written that in. Yeah. Workers' conversation. Just finished the day before. Mm-hmm. Finds a golden ticket. Hey, I'm good again. I'm, I'm um, cured. But when he did the dancing, so, like so, watching it as a kid, something, uh, and I, I still now when I watch it, you know, because because you, you see the movie from time to time, like right. on the movie channels or somewhere. But um, when he did the dancing, and then so before he did the dancing, he gets up out of bed, mm-hmm. and he stands up. He goes, oh, Ooh. I can stand. Yeah, yeah. Then he slowly goes back and falls on the bed. Do you remember that scene? Yes. Like, and so my worry was, hang on, he's going to crush the legs of the other three <laughs> grandparents. You know what I mean? But they just didn't flinch. Well, they got no feeling in their legs. Well, they they can't even walk. There's, there's, there's They're no in the bedroom. Yeah. Okay. So in my head, I'm thinking about where, how did they position the legs? Right. And how did he, was there a pillow there? How did he fall on? Mm-hmm. Three of them, they're, they're not even the leg that goes back. Mm-hmm. No flinching. And then he's up into the dancing. But it's funny, those little things that sort of stay with you. Sure. Slugworth, of course. President Br- of Chocolates Brilliant. Incorporated. Yes. Brilliant. Quite Batty. a great character. Scared, like, yes. oh, this guy's scared. You know, he, he was a... written into the... He was only mentioned in the book, but he was actually written in to be a major character for the film. So uh, You have to, yeah. yeah. They even the had the scar. Turnaround. Yeah. There's a bit of a scar, the scar yeah. Um, and then, brilliant how he just came back at, like, at the end. But speaking of falling, that opening scene, which for me was one of oh, the best yeah, scenes, yeah. when he, when Gene Wilder comes yeah. out, no one's seen Wonka. Yeah. They're, they're all you know, yeah. all the people waiting, the cameras are on. He comes out with the limp and the walking cane. And, and there's a sense of disappointment. Like right. everyone goes, oh, who is this guy? Oh, and then the he falls audience. forward, and everyone's like, oh, he's falling. Yeah. And then he does the somersault yeah, roll, really. and bam, back on. For me, that was one of the most brilliant moments because yeah. it encapsulated the whole yeah, character yeah. of Wonka. It's funny, you, it's funny you bring that scene up because, you know, as a child, like, even now, I'd, I'd, um, and I've done it several times, I rewind that scene. Yeah. Like, um, I want to see mm-hmm. where he sticks uh, the, uh, the, the cane. Into the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then keeps on walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. And I'm going, where's the hole? Mm-hmm. Is it there? What is it? How does he do this? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, so I did a few, a few times. I go, look at it. And then it, it, yes. it shudders, like, at the end. Yes. And he just lets go. And yes. He's got this brilliant moment, this brilliant facial like, and then he, and if you look at the somersault, like he leaves it to really late. Yes. If, for, if you watch that, because I've slowed it down, mm-hmm. that's how much I love this movie, right? And he leaves it really late, so he falls, so it really makes it look like he's going to fall. At last minute, he gets into a somersault Does the role. Yeah. and he comes out of it. Um, you, you know, that's how much I watch it. Yeah, you know that wasn't in the script. No, it wasn't. When Gene, I, like, yeah, yeah, when I, Gene I, Wilder yeah. was offered the film, yeah. he said, I won't do the film unless I can do the opening scene like this. Brilliant. And uh, it just gives you an insight on what a brilliant mind oh, Gene guy. Wilder yeah, yeah, was. Because yeah. the whole character is yeah. encapsulated in that. Like, yeah. here he is, nothing's what it seems. Yeah. This guy, you can't, you can't get this guy pegged because he'll, he'll go one direction and then bam, yeah. take you in another yeah, direction. Yeah. So, for, yeah, for me, that just encapsulated the whole character in that one moment. Very, uh, like, and just even... Um, the lessons, the, the different ch- the children, the children yes. the manners, 
And the uh, parents too. The parents. You just, know, the parents, you can see why these kids are the way they are with the exactly. parents like they have. Like, like, yeah. It worked on so many levels to educate. Like, yeah. for, for that, re-watching this film, I realise, I think it's made more for adults. Because it, I think, yeah. because it has a lot of dark undertones and a lot of commentary in there too. It does. And you couldn't make a movie like, like can you imagine trying to make a movie like this oh. and saying and, and writing a song about too much sugar, make you fat? Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. That. You, you, what? Yeah. <laughs> hey, hang on, you can't say yeah, that. You can't say that about a you kid. Can't you can't call this. him fat. You can't fat well, shame him. Well, what are yeah. we going to say? Like, well, I mean, yeah. if you eat too much, that's what happens. Yeah, but, you know, sure, you, sure. But, um, the, the, the Oompa Loompas, they're, Oompa Loompas. Truth, they're truth tellers. You can't, you can't even have those little people. Well, no, no, you wouldn't, would you? Could, you? you couldn't have them. But there's, there's, I mean, like on the shows I've been involved, like we've, we've used... Um, uh, small people, yeah. Small people. Uh, not midgets, because midgets are different to... Um, dwarves. Dwarves, yeah. Yes. So, because I, uh, I've got a uh, midget comedian mate. Yes. Uh, the, so they're in proportion. Yes. Dwarf has normal torso, but shorter arms and legs. Right. So people should know the difference. Yes. Um, but we've used them on our shows a lot of times. Mm. I've seen them. Not mm. I've used them personally, but I've seen them. And um, it's funny, they all have got together. I don't know if you know this. They've all got together. And they've charged a certain rate. Oh, right. So yeah. there's, all right. So if you want to use one for a movie or show, it's going to be... That amount. This much per day. Right, right. And no one's... But, so you can't... Uh, so you can't, you can't take advantage. Yeah, you can't take yeah. advantage. You can't try to go for another agency because they're all now the same. Right. And because the guys are going, well, you know, they're going to pay me, yes. I mean, how many times can I do Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Yeah. Right? Yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah, you've got to make it work well. And, yeah. and, and you're going to use it especially. But anyway, um, so yeah, the whole... Like the movie, there's so many highlights. The the ticket, the the number of chocolates, the, the greed of the rich man, yeah. you know, Veruca Salt's Veruca uh, Salt. father, yeah. yeah. He was great, that actor that played he, that. He so was memorable. Good. And that factory, I'm, I'm looking, I'm going, oh. And, and they're opening up all the boxes of chocolates. And I'm thinking, well, where are the chocolates going? Yeah. It should be going to harvest, uh, you know, or, or something. It's a waste. No one's even, they should at least stack them up and donate them somewhere to the poor. That's the th sort of things I was thinking about as a, as a child. I'm going, sure, they're not sure. even eating them. Yeah. Like, you know, they're just, uh, they're just bang, wasteful. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah. Uh, and then I love when he goes out the window, like she's very, very petulant and, yeah. and really, uh, you know, badly behaved and I want it now, Dad. Yeah. She played that part so well. She did, that, she, that, she that played girl. it. And yeah. then he goes, he goes, all right, I'm trying my best, darling. I'm trying my best, <laughs> love. And then he goes out the window, a thousand extra dollars for whatever he said. And then they all speed up. <laughs> like they weren't already going fast. I think he offered a bonus. I forget what the bonus was, but um, that was great. Um, the uh, August, Augustus, Augustus the, I still sometimes like it. Save some for later, Augustus. <laughs> like, you know, we always love quoting that like, you know, yeah. to each other. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, the chewing gum, the TV. Mike, the TV, he was probably the least bad about of all of them. Yeah. He was only watching TV. Yeah. Like, look what happens now. But apparently on Every set... Every child watches TV. Right. But apparently on set, he, he was rather obnoxious. And, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Gene yeah. Wilder was... <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was unbearable. Was unb like, you know, yeah. obviously those th things that you don't see, we don't yeah. get to see all but that it, But stuff. it's perfect for that part. Like, maybe the kid was like that. Just play yourself, you know? Just play himself, yeah. yeah. But it's funny because that was his bad thing. Like, mm. just love TV. Mm. That's like every child now. Sure. Love sure. games and TV. It's like, oh my sure. God. Like, but... Um, but yeah, once they yeah, you, you're right. But it's a great cautionary tale for 1971 because you uh, figure you, you, you compare it to now to the kids on their apps or on yeah, their phones. It's a similar, you know, similar cautionary tale. Absolutely unbelievable. Like when and then when um, when obviously the, the ticket found was brilliant, uh, and then they went in. I love straight away we got the the uh, Wonka character, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Sign this sort of thing, and yeah, the cast you can't, can't even read the contract. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm in the contract. So one guy, what is it? I can't read it. <laughs> he goes, and then you, you don't go in. You don't yeah. go in. He goes, give me the pen. Yeah. Really, like we really salt, really salt. Like, yeah, but he's I'm dry. Signing, I'm going in. It, so I'm so, I'm so, 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 so like, it's, yeah, and it's just brilliant. Just so brilliant. The way that he would play, Gene Wilder would play that dry response to this oh, obnoxious comment thrown at his yeah. way. There's this underlining sarcasm yeah. to his delivery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so much would be he could communicate so much in such a minimal, minimal brilliant. delivery. And just like, um, oh, we have so much time. So little to do. Wait, strike that. <laughs> Reverse it. Yeah. And then he'd do that several times. And and the adults, I love how we just. Uh, dismiss the adults and mm -hmm. certain things like, mm -hmm. is this some sort of a fun house? Why are you having fun? Yeah, ba just bang. Yeah, just or, move on. Oh, rock my off. Oh, oh hey, you know, like, and <laughs> yeah. um, and then when I go in the factory, it was just as a child. Into the yeah, chocolate room. The chocolate. Oh. Like, the chocolate. Sorry, the chocolate room. Yes. 
like as I'm watching now, I'm going, oh man, I would love to just be right. there. You know what I mean? Like every child's dream. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching with my brothers and sisters, and um, one of the times, like you know, I think one of the early times when Willy Wonka sang, uh, sang his song, mm. and he sat down. Pure imagination. Pure imagination. One of my favourites. And he gets a cup of tea mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, from the plant. Yes. You know, and he starts drinking it. And then at the end, he finishes and he looks at it and he just eats it. And we laugh their heads off. Yeah. He takes a bite out of the cup, you know. And we thought that was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> like, you know, we just loved it. Um, and then the lesson started and we lose, the, you know, we lose them one by one. Mm. Um, and even at, like towards the end, once again, Grandpa Joe tells, uh, tells yeah. Charlie, let's drink this soda. Yeah. Bad influence. He was a real baddie in the movie. He was. He was and then movie. even afterwards, and then, so then Charlie finds out, you, you, you lose, yeah. you, 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 we're going to have to clean everything, yeah. you, you, you broke the rules, you, you lose. You know? yeah. And they're leaving. And even then... He goes off his he, head. He goes off his head at him. And, and, and I, think, I think he was coming more from himself on that. Yeah. Like, not about Charlie, it's about how, you, how dare you talk, talk to the me. The speech like, was unbelievable. But then he says to him... You broke a... You, you yeah. told, you're yeah. nothing but a swine and a swindle or something. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. But then he says to Charlie, don't worry, we'll give that to Slugworth. Like he's still in Charlie's ear telling him to, you know... Still. Yeah. And yeah. Charlie though, th th this is great. Charlie, he had his own ethics and morals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Took the gobstopper back, and that was unbelievable. The, and then that—that's what you know changed yeah. everything for Wonka. He, he passed the test. Everything was a test. test. And you know? what about the room? How good was the room? Everything was cut in oh, half. Oh yeah, yeah. Everything's in Everything's half. Everything's cut in half. Yeah. That was brilliant. It's great. It's got the—it's got the clock. Half the clock. Half the clock. And he even when he went to, for some paperwork, he was doing some paperwork. Even though it was a half, he actually opened up the half and he got, <laughs> he got like some paper and right. he closed it again. That's he right. could have just got it from the side. Right. But no, right. no, he had to open it up and yeah. just those little things which I, which I loved and appreciated. Um, and and it's, yeah. it's lovely that line at the end, which apparently wasn't in, wasn't in the book. And, the, uh, and apparently the ending was they take off in the glass elevator, and the final line was. Um, 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 Grandpa Joe going whippee, and the director's like, we can't end a film on this. No, that's. And the writer was away on. Um, he had written it. He yep. done with it. He was away. This is in the day before you had mobile phones or anything. Yeah, yeah. He was at his um, getaway fishing um, lodge in the middle of nowhere yep. in Montana or something, right? And they need. They were on set. They needed the ending to the to the film, and so there was a communal phone. Uh, um, in, with all the properties around that rang really loud and so he heard it, he went there, it was the director we need an ending to this film and he said alright well let me go work on it he goes no, I got everyone waiting on set we need, we need like the now. ending line, we need it now yeah. and he stopped for a moment, he thought he delivered the line and then that's the final line as they're taking off and, and um, rolled, uh, not rolled, uh, Willy Wonka leans down to um, Charlie and says uh, um, do you know what? Do you know the story about the the kid that got everything he ever wanted? And he's like, no. He goes, he was happy ever after. He lives happily he ever lived after. Ha yeah. yeah. And then it just, you know, it was a lovely ending to yeah, the yeah, yeah. Uh, to the to the film. It, you know? It'd be good if they um, took like, why didn't they do another movie from that point? Well, that the Roald Dahl wrote the book, um, Charlie in the Glass Elevator. Yeah, but I want to see like. Yeah, but all the family moving yeah, in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to see Grandpa Joe yeah. really just gorging in chocolate, <laughs> yeah. and then yeah. all four of them like out. Like they I, I, I got, got their own beds. It would have been a great side story: the antagonistic relationship between Wonka and yeah, Grandpa yeah, yeah, Joe. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. them two having to live together. Yeah, because yeah. Wonka's going to. I still remember, like you know, you called me a swindle and a spy. Yeah. I think a swindle and a swine or yeah, something like yeah. that. I don't forget. Yeah, you broke the. You broke his young boy's dream. How could you do that? <laughs> yeah. Is it, uh, yeah, I know, and you did the. Yeah. I, so, I Hang on, Joe. You're the reason why this dream was broken, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. How about looking in the mirror, uh, that, Grandpa Joe? I think it'd be a success, like they, if they yeah. did that movie. So we've had another classic film oh, that you've shared with us. It's it's an absolute classic. Um, they just don't make movies like this mm. anymore, mm. for various reasons. But uh, you know, like this one, like my other choice would have been Wizard of Oz. Oh. love the Wizard of Oz, right? And it's not to say that. Because you're right, these sort of movies stay with you. They have an impact on you when you're sure. younger, I guess, or an experience that just stays. Like as a child, it's incredible. Like, mm -hmm. you know, but, I mean, what are you gonna, if you watch movies these days, what are you going to say? Oh, my favourite movie is Fast and Furious number eight. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't, like, I love The Shawshank Redemption. Brilliant. Mm. One of my all time favourites as well. But 
for a movie to, you know, most movies as when we're younger has an impact, mm -hmm. deep impact. Um, and that's what it was like as a child. It's just, you watch it differently, it's brilliant, but as an adult can still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That's a legend, that's a classic. Well, and I think the difference, like you just gave then, like Fast and the Furious or a franchise like that, it becomes cookie cutter. Mm. You know, you know what it's going to be. The, it, it, it's, a, it's a studio safe bet. But yep. with a film like this, it's like, it's not on the radar. No, the, yeah. it, it's unique. It's the same with a film like uh, Wizard of Oz. There's nothing yeah. like that before. It was a unique film. Unbelievable. They don't know if it's going to be the success it's going to be. Like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Initially, it wasn't the big success, no, it, but, it, but then it, it yeah. caught on later on yeah. and really became... You know, more, a lot more than a cult classic became like a mainstream classic. Exactly. But, but it was because of that uniqueness. And I, I think, I, I don't know if it's in, in Hollywood or what, but whether they take enough risks on unique exactly. ideas these days. That, imagine you try to pitch a script like this. Yeah. You go, uh, right. Yeah. You know, I mean, what do you do? You've got to just stick to your guns and um, I'll keep pitching unique stuff. Mm -hmm. You have to. There's another sure, way. Sure, sure. You get rejected, you get rejected. If they don't see it, they don't see it. Mm hmm does it matter. Mm -hmm. On to the next idea. On to the next idea. Yeah. Well, on to our next thing, yeah. which is your favourite book. Yes. Um, look, once you get asked like for a favourite book, um, you, you want, what does it come to mind? Like, what, this is the one that came to my mind immediately. Right. And, um, and I do a lot of audio books these days, mm -hmm. and, uh, which I love. You can, you know, but when you're this, on tour, you're driving, tour, yeah, you can one. listen. Yeah. But this one I actually read physically, which is unusual right. for a lot of people these days. But this one I read physically, and I couldn't put it. I, I had to finish the whole thing, open by Andre Agassi, and we all, you know, followed his career. I loved it. Honestly, like I loved. What was good about his career was he was a young prod prodigy, and then he 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 killed it. Took a big break. Mm. Then came back and had more success. Right. Like so, when he took a break. Yeah, thought, he'd been written off. He'd been written off. Like he's yeah, not going to come back. He'd fallen behind in the rankings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when when so, like it's like a rocky comeback. Mm -hmm. And you want to go for it. You want to root for him. You say, mm -hmm. come on, you can like. And when he came back, he was actually fitter than ever. Right. Which is amazing. So mm -hmm. he was because he, he was out of shape, and then he came back in a shape, which is incredible. And became number one again. Number one again, mm. where he would just he was so good, he would actually run around. The opponents from side to side. Right. That was his tactic. He'd yeah, he'd run them down. He'd, he'd be in center. He'd take center position, like so tactic, tactically, and he would just move him. So he and he'd, he'd often say, "I want to take the legs out of my opponent." Mm. I say, "Eventually, if you're not as fit as him, you're going to slow down, and then he can just kill you off." Mm -hmm. right? And I thought, "Wow, that's brilliant!" Like because he knows he's done the work. Mm. He knows, and he'd often win. He'd often have success at the Australian Open, mm. traditionally played in January, the hot heat. conditions. And people have just come off a Christmas season, and if you haven't trained hard enough, and you turn up to Melbourne, Australia in January, mm -hmm. you're going to get you're going to cop it. Mm -hmm. If you have another, and he'd often do the work. Mm -hmm. He would he would the, love it. I, I remember reading this book and loved it as well. Yeah. But on on that topic of the heat, because he as a kid he grew mm. up in Vegas. That, yeah, and that's training right, yeah. in Vegas in that desert heat. Yeah. So when he would be in those forty plus degree. Uh, Heat waves at the Melbourne yeah. uh, Australian Open. The other, the, his opponents would be faltering under the heat, and he's like, "I'm in my prime here. This is in his the, prime." Yeah. But he, he's done a big preseason before that. He knows, right? So like, even if you've grown up in the heat, if you haven't done the hard work, mm, you the prep. And, and mm. he was skillful, but super fit as well. But you know, after look, the Open is, is a great title for this book because it really was. He just. He just gave it all. Mm -hmm. Like he, he just all his feelings, his relationships, his, relationships, his um, drug use, the speed. drug use, yeah. the whole thing, and of course, what stands out. A lot of people comment his disdain and hate for tennis. Yeah, like and he, and mm. and I love the technique because he repeated it a few times throughout the book. Right, mm -hmm. oh, I hate tennis. I hate tennis. Did I tell you I hate tennis? Mm. Um, and eventually, he realised like, does he really hate tennis? Like, I don't think he does. Like, but he hated. You know, you know what I mean? I think, yeah, it's, well, I think it's beyond that. Like, I, if you ask him now, Andre, do you hate tennis? I, I think he said, no, I'm, he's got a love for the sport. Mm -hmm. But he hated, I think, it was more than I hate. He, he was forced. With the connection with his father, and the his connection. father was such a dominating that's what I'm saying. figure. Like, and I think that's what he hated. Mm. It wasn't just he hated tennis. Yes. Tennis gave him everything. Right. He's got his charities, 
He's got his scores, his, his build. His wife. His wife. Yeah, Steffi Graf, legendary. You'll come to, right? But so when I, when I read that, I first thought, oh, maybe he does hate tennis. But like, okay, the deeper you go into it, by the end you realise, hang on, he doesn't hate tennis. He just hates the process, what he, had to, what he was forced to mm-hmm. endure to go through. Like, you know, if right. you had like a dad saying, mate, do this. Like, as a child, sometimes you don't want to do it. Well, there's a little kid out. I remember yeah. it, 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 when he was... He was crying. He was, he was in riding. tears. Yeah, but his father had the, the, the machine, the tennis yeah. machine called the dragon that would shoot the balls at him. Yeah. But his father rigged it up so there'd be twice as many ball, balls in it. <laughs> and it would get to the point where he's a little kid running around. He couldn't even run. The whole, the whole court was just filled with balls. There was, no, there was nowhere to run. He was Not tripping to mention, over it. You can yeah. do an ankle. Yeah. You can step on a ball. You know, yeah. like, so... When he says that, like, which is a big talking point for a lot of people who read the book, mm. and there's been so many reviews and people have just loved it, but I, yeah, when I, my feeling, that's my, that's my sort of stance on it, I don't think he really hates tennis. Right, I right. think he really, just the pro, because so his young prodigy, forced, dictator dad, you know, and again, he says, look, he loved his dad, mm-hmm. but he hated him, what he went through. Yeah, what he forced him to do. What he forced him to do. Like, you know, you yes. love your dad, like, but... Was four, and so there's a, there's he was good. Like right. he, was, he was good. Well, That's the thing. Y- yeah, he had the he was talent. He a gun. He had yeah. a talent. He and was, his father could see that in him. And he was, uh, and uh, Nick uh, Bolateri, like the school, of, like he saw, like again, yes. this guy, this guy's got it. Like mm-hmm. he can tell the skill of of the of the man, right? And then so he's come on the scene. He's is as a junior, like I think he was very young when he met his dad. I think sixteen or seventeen, mm-hmm. like, um, and he had the long hair. And mm-hmm. again, we delve into this part of life. Right? So the image that came the image, with the so he's got the earring, the hell, the thing, the headband, the, the fluorescent, head, the fluorescent, yeah. you know, and and he was standing out from Vegas, is this brash guy, mm. and so people loved him. The younger generation loved him. The older just they, go, they couldn't work it out, and, and some people hated him. They go, yeah. no, this is just like Jimmy Connors, too brash for us. Yeah, too brash. This guy, like, look, what's what is this? All mm. this, you know, um, but we didn't know what he was going through, yeah. and the book, like, it was incredible. Reveals all of that. Yeah, he was losing hair, like eventually. Wearing a wig. Wearing a wig. In the and, uh, that great story he tells where, at the French Open when he, yeah. f- he forgot his shampoo and used the wrong shampoo on his oh. wig, and it was like falling apart. Yeah, and he had to use bobby pins to put it into his bandana That's to right. hold it on his yeah. head during the the final of the uh, Roland Garros. Incredible, incredible. Yeah. And he said he goes the, the, often um, he is more worried about his hair. Flying off flying in the off, middle of a match. Being exposed. Mm. Like, he's not even worried about the tactics of the match. <laughs> That's secondary and third. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, number one, he's going, I'm going to get ashamed. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to be, the, the lie's going to be exposed. Mm. And so then he comes out. And imagine having to play. And, and the French, the, on clay, it's longer matches. You've got mm-hmm. to slide and it's a different sort of game. Um, but yeah, could you imagine? Like, if anyone, if anyone's going to fall off, it's going to be the French Open. Sure. Sure. Right? With, the, with the clay and, and the sure. slowness and the, and the longer matches. But just to go through that. And also to the mental strength that he had. Yeah. Where, when he's talking, th- the way that he gets you into the mindset of what he is going through in a match. Yep. And when he was doing the American Open and he, um, the US Open, and he had real bad back problems. And he's like, yeah. I have to win these first two sets in order to take That's this right. final out. And it went into the third set, and and he and he was so worried on the court because he goes, "That's when my back's going to start seizing up, and I'm not going to be able to play my, my full game." Yeah. And, and him just going through the mental challenge that he had, to, and he's like lying on the ground, um, trying to yeah. overcome the pain, getting back up, and he ends up winning that, and he gets home to gets back to his five star hotel in Manhattan, and he can't sleep in the in the bed. He has to sleep on the floor on the hard surface. And I really connected to that because I have uh, scoliosis, which was really painful when I was a kid. And I had those nights where I'd have to roll out of bed and sleep on the floor just because the pain was just so much. And so it was a very... What a, what a waste of a hotel room. I know. <laughs> yeah, five star as well. Yeah. But yeah, so like eventually um, he, uh, he loses his hair. Mm-hmm. And it must have been a ma- it was like it was a massive relief. Mm, yeah. Like, could you imagine that? that that's when he played. But, but then injury got him... Um, where he actually had to retire. Mm, oh, he stepped, he stepped yeah. away. Like, no, he actually stepped away where he stopped mm. for various reasons. But, mm. uh, injury was one of them. Mm. His back was so bad. But then he rebuilt himself mm-hmm. and, he, and he got stronger. He realised so he, he did all these other things. So he stopped playing, um, became stronger, fitter, and he came back 
mm. 2.0, even better. Yeah. Like, it was unbelievable. When he came, and then you want to, like, as a fan, you want to go for him now because, like, now all of a sudden he has all the supporters. Yeah, he's the comeback he's, again, kid. Everyone loves that, right? Yeah. He's come back. It's, we know he's worked hard and he's, and he's a changed person. Yes. He's not that brash, brash. young kid anymore. Yeah. He's respectful. Mm -hmm. He speaks well. Yeah. Wiser. What a guy. Mm. Like, you know, it's just, I loved hearing him in interviews. You he's know, brilliant. You know what I thought was interesting? Because um, when I, I used to work for Amazing Jonathan, he would yep. perform at the Tony Robbins seminars yep. as like a guest speaker. And Tony Robbins yeah. is up there talking about how to... Unleash the power within. Yeah, yeah. Tony's up there having like a chat about how to have a successful marriage. The next minute, Jonathan's up there stabbing his wife in the head. <laughs> you know, and Tony's loving it. Tony just thought Jonathan was hilarious. Yeah. But he, I remember him talking about working with Andre Agassi over the mental game uh, of, of sports and tennis and getting him back into that mindset to be number one again. And he, and he used that a lot in his Brilliant. promotional stuff. But when I read Open, no mention of that. No I mention. thought that was interesting. Yeah, why? I don't know. Uh, I've never known, but I just, I just thought that was an That's interesting. That's deep. Maybe it wasn't. It didn't have the impact that he thought it. it yeah, maybe Tony thought it had more of an impact than it, yeah. uh, than, uh, the guy's than Andre on. recognized. Yeah, when he he came back and he had so much success and he won more majors, and he just kept adding to the tally. It was just it was brilliant. Uh, and then the guy gets married to Steffi Graf. Right. But he has he has a fling with Brooke, Brooke Shields. Shields. Yeah, they were married and yeah. But I, from the autobiography, it feels that they just weren't a right match. Like, and it's like so we don't know at this stage. Think okay, uh, Brooke's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, people are getting together, but really, when you listen to Andre interviews and the guy's intelligent, he's sure. well spoken. Sure. Okay, I really enjoy listening to this guy. Mm -hmm. He's He's just, he's just a really good human being. Mm. Like he speaks well in mat, like after the matches. And, sure. And it's no one, and Steffi Graf, I didn't, we didn't know that well. I didn't know that well. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it makes sense. Smart, like two intellectual people getting together. Mm -hmm. Common bond. Like it's mm -hmm. unusual, like two legends of the game. Sure. That was unusual. But hey, it and, works. And, and he's set up his um, academy, his school. But he, said, he, goes, he says, he goes, well, Steffi goes, he goes, it was just meant to be. He realized yeah. this is it. Mm. Like, you know, he goes, I, she challenged me on so many different uh, things and, and uh, it just worked for him, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It wasn't someone that just said, yeah, like, uh, just say yes, yes, yes. But no, Steffi, the, he just said it just worked. And he just, you know, he goes, when you just see, he goes, yeah, just felt it and bang. For the, for the outside, like public, me and everyone else, go, two legends in the game again. What a, what a story. What a, like, sure. you know, like she was, she's one of the best. Yeah. If not, they, like her record speaks for herself, the number of majors and, um, I think uh, since that time, I think um, Serena's passed her, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, and then, you know, this is how decent they are. Like, they have, they've got fame and they've got fortune, but do they just rest? No, they, they do good by it, which is incredible. You know what I mean? They don't just say, oh, yeah, just relax. And they set up schools, help charities. Help underprivileged kids. Help other people, which hats off. Sure. Like, brilliant. He doesn't have to do that, but he did it, and he loves it. Mm -hmm. But it just goes to show the type of people they are. Like, and, um, yeah, the book was amazing. It was all in that. Like, setting up. You go, what am I going to do? You've retired? Like, okay, well, now he's got something to do. Sure. Going around all these things, and he does fundraisers and things and all sorts of stuff. And people still love him and know him. Sure. Absolutely brilliant. So what a, what a, what a life. What a book. Like, just, but really, the initial upbringing in Vegas, the pressures, the school, which he hated, like, you mm -hmm. know, it'd always be, it'd always be wagon school and leaving. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the dangers involved as well, like mm -hmm. it, there was some danger involved when we were growing up. Uh, the drug use, of course, as well, C could have easily fallen off, easily. Sure, easily, sure. Like, you know? But the fact that he, he, he passed all of his drug tests too, mm. when he was taking speed, Doing speed, yeah, in these massive tournaments, you know, it's a, but it's crazy. I think like that. Sometimes back in the, those days, they weren't testing for every, like the, the test wouldn't pick up everything. Yeah, it wasn't. As they would, they would never think he's not taking meth. He ain't doing speed. No, no, come on. But but oh, the tests weren't like for, they're not as uh, they're not as thorough now. Mm. Like like now that they've gotten a lot better. Yeah. Um. Yeah. In those days, you can even fake your own urine sample. Mm -hmm. Which they did in, in the yeah. Olympics. 
somebody else would somebody else would just hey listen I've got a urine can you do you mind you yeah go to some guy that's like you know sure that's sort of top 100 clearly not on it sure <laughs> or like Lance Armstrong just getting a full transfusion oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, we could do a whole show on that guy yeah um so I read his book too. Like, which, right, but, right. Yeah, like a whole transmission of blood. But and, the great thing about a book like this or like Mike Tyson's um, book, yeah. The Undisputed Truth, yep. is it goes way beyond the sport. Yes. You know, you're getting all these different life lessons through yeah. th through what the, the challenges. That, and you could just cut and paste that challenge for business, for personal life exactly. or whatever. Exactly. The, the, just the way that these guys handle those situations and yeah, just the wisdom that they have from being at the top of their field and having all of the temptations, all of the, the challenges, yet coming out the other side, having a sense of personal growth and improvement. And that's what happened. That's exactly, you hit the nail on the head. Like, I mean, when, uh, that's what I think the public love him so much because we, we saw the personal growth. Mm -hmm. And, okay, he's got a tennis career, but you're right, like his upbringing, how many children are forced to do something which they're not really all forced in, a, in, a, in the wrong way? Mm. Mm. Push them the wrong way, mm. and this guy had skill and talent, obviously, mm. and and you know great uh, training at the, the academies and all that. But he was just pushed too much. He wanted mm -hmm. a childhood as well, yes, which he didn't get. And yes. it happens in a lot of different sports, not just sure. tennis, right? Sure. And he's saying, "I hate tennis," but he, I believe that's just my interpretation. He doesn't. He hates. A pro, he hates. He had the process of what right. happened, right? Um, because really, when you think about it, tennis has given everything, mm -hmm. like his life, the ability to help other people, which he really appreciates now. Mm -hmm. um, he even says that, like, obviously, without tennis, like, he doesn't get to do this, set up schools, this, underprivileged, like, all sorts of stuff, like, all over the world. Um, so, in that respect, you're right, like, and what he's gone through, like, it can be applied to so many different ways. Mm. And then, of course, the comeback, absolutely brilliant, mm. absolutely brilliant. So, um, yeah, the books stay with me. Like, some books you read, you forget about other books, you know what? Wow, I just remember like just being engrossed in it, mm. engrossed in it, and, and because I, I remember watching his career. Sure. And sure. then now you're getting the curtain being pulled, pulled back, back, and having a look at, oh right, this was happening and that was happening, and and, you know, and sometimes he'll talk about certain matches, and I would actually go back and look at it on right, YouTube. Right, right, you know I mean? I said, right. I said, oh right, and he was going through that, and 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 during the French Open final. Look, it, like we're watching a game. This guy's thinking about other stuff. <laughs> hey, I'm going to be, you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the, the light's going to be exposed. Yeah. My hair's going to fall off. Yeah. You know, so he's thinking about that rather than the match. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah, it is. The match it is easy for him. Sure, I'm, sure. I'm telling I can beat this person, beat this guy, but, you know, with the hair, could you make the, the rug on. The shame. <laughs> that's why I'm, I go bored with match. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to worry. I don't worry about that's it. That's it. People often think, they go, well, how come you... Because I wear hats to make it, you know, a bit of fun, this, that. But I, it's not that I, I tell people, I'm, you know, I just shave it off um, like he did. I just shave it off. I'm relaxed yeah. now. I don't have to worry about it. No, you don't have to worry about shampoo. You don't have to worry about shampoo. People yeah. go, you, you don't have to, to worry about having a bad hair day. People go, you should go to Turkey and do that hair transplant like everyone else. I go, what for? <laughs> I'll, get what enro for? I'll get enrolled in the bloody army. I'll lose my hair I again. Know, I <laughs> but then they go, but to, I think um, to do the hair transplant, you've got to take. So I assume that people do a hair transplant. Right, to look good to the opposite sex, right? Right. That's what some guys do. I want to look sexy for the girls. Right. Or not these days. I'm not, I don't want to... You need a pigeonhole. I don't want to pigeonhole yeah. anybody, but I'm yeah. just saying old-fashioned way. Like, um, so some guys go, yeah, I want to take it. Yeah, if I take this thing, the hair will grow back. I'll look sexy for the, for the girls. But when you take those drugs, one of the things that... One of the side effects is... Impotence. Impotence and a drop in libido. <laughs> <laughs> which is true, right? Yeah. Something, hang on, you want me to take this drug which drives me a little bit. I, look, I, I now look good to the girls, yeah. but I don't want to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like it. So I'd rather be bald. Ferrari would not have no license. I, I've said this, yeah. but I'd rather be bald and horny. <laughs> rather than. <laughs> anyway, I don't know how we've got to like bald and. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. Well, this has been great, man. It's, it's, oh. Like I said, it's always a pleasure to sit down. Time always flies. No, I love it. And, and look. This was a genuine, uh, you know, I love your podcast and things that you do. Um, love spending time with you. I'm not one of those comedians to come on, one of your guests to come on and promote themselves, you know what I mean? I, yeah, yeah. That's not my style. <laughs> like, you know, so look, anyway, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> oh, there's my website right there. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't, I'm not, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't mention that. Don't okay, mention okay, it. I'm okay. not one of those guys sure, who come on sure. and try to promote. <laughs> but um, it's been brilliant. Like, I hope this uh, podcast goes worldwide. Yeah. 
Well, what's well, it? Well, it is. I think Any, anyone, have can enjoyed... listen, anyone can listen from all over the world. We've had a good so... chat. Like, if people have enjoyed this, they should just share this. Sure. Do the right thing and share it. Yeah, share, yeah. subscribe, all of that, Jazz. I told people I'm bald. Look. Yeah, come on. Come on. What more do you want? Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, I could have had hair, but I've said no to hair. Like, yeah. we've, we've revealed some deep stuff. Yeah, we've we... had some comedy stories, some stuff I've enjoyed. Some things you're passionate about. Well, yeah. well I look... Share, share, please. Well, Thank you for coming and uh, sharing with us today, mate. And I look forward to more times, uh, more great experiences together down the line. Hope so, buddy. Pleasure. Thank you, mate. Pleasure.